So, Darren, <laughs> you're very welcome to our channel. Um, and yeah, know, thank you. <laughs> I, it's my pleasure to have you here. Um, of course, uh, after this, we will put subtitles in this, yeah, this interview so yeah. people can understand us better. Yeah, but sorry for, for not speaking Portuguese. It <laughs> would have helped, I guess. Uh, yeah. But you, you, you try and you do a very good work. Uh, even without speaking Portuguese, you yeah. told me before that you, you got to talk to a lot of people. And I believe that most of them don't speak English here. And you you got uh, yourself very well th through the cities of Brazil, yeah. to the places. Yeah. You went to places that many people here do not uh, have access to and only dream of to be there. Yeah, it, I was very lucky in that sense. Yeah, very lucky. <laughs> uh. So I would like to know uh, the principal question. Like, I would like to know how do you got into tanks, man? Because I'm into tanks, and yeah, a lot of people say, "Why are you into tanks?" Like, tanks. I know that like, question. What? It's What's still this? a difficult question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why are you interested in rolling death machines? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's literally a rolling death machine. Because yeah, what else? What else has this? this uh, what else is this stuff? Uh, yeah. And it's difficult for me to answer in a way that most people will understand. I try to answer by saying these things are like the pinnacle of their field. These things yep. are historic machines that made made 20th century history. And I just like them. I just like to look at them. They are awesome. But what do you say when people ask you about this? Um, the first thing I usually say, it's a hobby that spiraled way out of control. That, that, that is, I think, the, the thing I usually start off with. Um, I also like to sort of make the comparison. You got, um, you also got car guys, guys that know everything about cars, just adore them. They could name every brand there is, know which engine is in there and so on. And in my opinion, it's sort of the same with tanks for me. Uh, it, they, for some reason, they really speak to me in the sense, um, the tech in there, uh, the ar the armor, uh, it, it's just amazing that you have a vehicle that can weigh up to 60 tons that just goes 60 kilometers an hour uh, and do basically whatever you uh, want with it on land. Um, but yeah, there is just something interesting uh, with them. The history of them is interesting. Uh, you have a very sort of... you. Some tanks are sort of simple development wise. Yeah. But you also have like tanks that the developments are are so long and so complicated that at some point you're you're like, how did this thing even become a thing at this point? Yeah. Um it really gives you an insight in how uh how a military uh, or a government tries to develop a piece of armament with all the politics involved and all the uh, knowledge required. And there are very different visions in there. And that brings a pretty wide variety to the subject. Yes. Uh, let alone the very long history, over 100 years now. One one story that comes to my mind when you say uh, talk about a complex development of uh, armored vehicles is the Bradley AFV. Yeah, yeah, it is complex, but um, I think you are also referring to the uh, Pentagon Wars movie. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that, that thing, that 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 thing comes to mind when I yeah. when I think about those complex developments. And I'm sure that you might know some much, much, uh, much more dense and much more complicated cases. But that one got to the media, got to the to the, the popular. Yeah, culture. it's one of those vehicles that sort of turns into a scandal. Um, mainly, it, it's sort of one of those cases. We have the M113, which is a very 
a simple vehicle in its purpose, it's very hard to replace. Um, yeah. And even now they are still like, yeah, uh, how are we actually going to replace this thing? Because it's a cheap box that does what it is supposed to do. Yes, and exactly. you see them going to the design of replacement and then they very quick, eventually they go further and further and further and start adding on more stuff and more stuff because otherwise you're just building on another M113, which is more expensive. And that's not really what you want. Yeah. Um, but other cases, for example, the M103 uh, heavy tank for which I uh, wrote an article on the website, uh, it's the T43 heavy tank, but um, that development program started around 1948 and it was horrible and eventually in 1957 they uh entered trials and then you have like uh general clark he was one of the heads of the uh, american army in germany uh yeah. during the cold war and he basically uh said to them they should not test if uh the tanks are any good but if they are usable which basically means we want uh, i don't want a tank that I can, uh, that is perfect. I just want a tank that can drive from point A to B, have a very big gun, and blow up any Soviet tank that can that may drive uh, towards me. Uh, <laughs> basically, he wanted a motorized anti-tank gun, which they sort of were, but the original requirements asked for something more, an actual breakthrough tank like a Tiger, and not just oh, we'll drive there and then it will just blow up tanks and that's it and he even stated after that just so we don't have to explain to congress uh that we wasted millions of tax dollar money <laughs> which is even more insane <laughs> yeah that that is the uh m103, the m103. and this yeah. is specifically the m103 a2 which uh it, it gets even more wild <laughs> <laughs> uh, because the Americans eventually just went with it, and the Marine Corps was actually the the branch that wanted the M103. Um, but the M103 that the, um, the Army got was not great, so the Marine Corps wanted to modernize it, which they did. Uh, they hoped the Army would pay help pay for the modernizations, which they didn't. But then the Army happily leased 78 modernized tanks from the United States Marine Corps, of course. Because they did all the hard work now. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. This first phase of, of Cold War tanks, they uh, present several several dead ends, technology dead ends. Like they, they pursued some things that really quickly became apparent. No, this is not the right way to go. We should proceed yeah. uh, in another direction. Uh, yeah, you, you see, like, uh, after you, you already see it in World War II a little bit more during the end, but um, in the very much in the early Cold War, you get all kinds of really weird tank designs that just go everywhere. Yeah. Um, and a lot of new concepts, and that's what makes Cold War tanks very interesting. Um, you get a lot more concept. It's not necessarily a steel box with a big cannon anymore. It's very generalizing for World War II tanks, but you really get new concepts like composite armor, um, APDS, APFSDS fairly fairly early on already, uh, explosive reactive armor, although I think the Australians already had a project for explosive reactive armor in World War II. Uh, little known, but it was there. Um, and eventually you sort of see countries struggle with uh especially the americans for example but there's also the russians with we can implement this tech but it's very difficult to actually do it properly at times so you have the t64 that very much suffers with its engine for a very long time and from memory but i'm not the expert on soviet tanks that the armor wasn't that great in the end either but you do get an automatic loader, a 125 millimeter gun, um, but you also have the T62, which fairly early on uh, introduced APFSDS, which yes. uh, was amazing. But you also have the Americans with the, I think the T95 medium tank project, which is basically them just 
going insane, try a lot of stuff uh, like uh, like forms of composite armor, uh, but also turrets and so on. And eventually that sort of translates over to the M60 pattern, but also a lot doesn't because some stuff just doesn't work or the money is just not there to actually make things happen. Yeah. Um, I think a good example is the, uh, for the Americans at least, is the, um, uh, what do you call them? The the turrets from the T-54 uh, and the Amex 13 turrets. Um, they have a name. It's the, the ones that sort of, uh, where the entire turret sort of... Uh, oh, yes. Cancelated. I know what you mean, but I, I also don't know the technical name for I it. I briefly forgot the name, which... Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, for the Americans, it fairly quickly on, it just goes nowhere. For the French, however, it just... The Amex Make 13 is, yeah. <laughs> is for them a fairly successful export vehicle, yeah. especially in South America. You know that the Marine Corps in Brazil has these things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they have the SK-105, uh, which is an Austrian of hull course, where yeah. they yeah. put on the French turret and made some adjustments to the turret. I think it was stabilized even, which is quite amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was... I think that's also the very first tank that the Brazilian Marine Corps got. They had some previous attempts, but they were denied by the army and a company went bankrupt. So <laughs> <laughs> eventually they got there. <laughs> yeah, I believe they are they are still in use. They they they, they don't have yeah. replacements so far. For, no, they for, were for looking vehicle. around, but uh, I think they once mentioned that they may want or that they were looking around and that the M1 Abrams was maybe a thing. And then people just sort of went like, hey, they want to buy the M1 Abrams, which they didn't really say. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's difficult for Marine Corps, uh, for Marine Corps to find a tank, especially if you're not the United States Marine Corps, which, has <laughs> a, which, which is basically which... another army. So. Yeah, another army, but the, the USMC it had gave up. It's tanks, yeah. right? Gave up. Yeah, they recently gave up tanks. Um, I'm not completely sure why. It mainly seems that um, the protection requirements uh, now for tanks just don't match the logisticals uh, of uh, doing island hopping uh, yes. campaigns and such. It was something around that reasoning, but uh, I haven't looked too much into it. A uh, bit of a shame, but from the other point of view, uh, they, I can see why they did it. There's a doctrine there. Yeah. Um, th it's not that they just like, oh yeah, we just ditched them and we're done with it. Yeah, there, there has to be some uh, reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me, well, this is the first, the first. Um, it's, this is the first. It's not a job, I think. We cannot call it no, a job. No, but, it's definitely uh, not a job. Uh, but, <laughs> I wish it was a job, but it's definitely <laughs> not. Every, every, every one of us uh, want to land a job that uh, it's at least related to, to this kind of subject, right? But yeah, you got involved with Tank Encyclopedia. And yep. Tank Encyclopedia is like this vast, um, really, really uh, complete database it's actually a virtual yeah. museum huh? that yeah, they, they say it's a virtual museum yeah. and a virtual museum of tanks on the internet and yeah. i don't know of any other database repository that is more complex more vast more interesting and well illustrated actually than yeah. tanks encyclopedia yeah so you got involved with this. I know that it's a multinational initiative. There's this, yeah. this guy that um, is the leader, but there's people from several countries. Yeah, many. So how do you so, get involved with this? Yeah, so it, actually it's very easy to get involved. The difficult part is actually writing the article and then, uh, or gathering sources, writing the article, and then actually sort of pull through because you have... a. a a lot of times you, you have people like, hey, I want to write an article. And then they, when they actually start writing an article, they start to realize, 
what it actually entails and then it and uh they sometimes tend to pick a vehicle that is just insane to write on for a first article um and it just gets out of hand and they give up yeah. um i've tried to i have helped a couple of people actually to go through the entire process um with mixed success um i think i helped uh i helped a guy from thailand and uh, he's I know now that writing his third article for the website so that yeah. has been a good uh uh, has been a success i've also tried to get a few brazilians <laughs> um but basically how it works is um you go to our discord we have the thanks encyclopedia community chat discord i think the link is on the website yeah um and then there is a chat under there which is writers and proofreaders and there you essentially say like yo i want to write an article for you um and then you can propose a vehicle you would want to write on, which can be anything you want, really. Uh, and we'll just check, is somebody already writing on it? Uh, or um, do we already have it on the website? Or does it the one on the website need a rewrite? Because that's also a thing. Um, and if, the, uh, if we agree that you can or accept the proposal, then you can just start writing. And it doesn't matter if you're busy for a year or half a year um, and when you hand it in we'll take a look at it if it's good you can join the team and if it's not good um, then uh, right. we'll try to guide you to uh, eventually end up with a good article but sometimes there, there is an entire sort of how to write an article according to our structure um, but sometimes it's such a difficult uh, subject that it's very difficult to actually help someone uh, with right. that. Um, but in principle, it's pretty easy. It's mainly that the person that wants to write has to do it himself in a way. It's we're, we're not going to completely pull you along on how to write an article. There should be your own initiative. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh most people would like to begin with a vehicle that maybe it's already well documented like any yeah. world war ii vehicles That's panzers difficult. and and american tanks things like that that are extensively described yeah. in in books and documentaries and general yeah. literature you have to go actually uh you have to go you should to cooperate with such a database, you have to go to these backwater uh, channels and find these obscure vehicles that yep. nobody has tried to um, describe before. Yeah, or you you can do a large article if you really want to, but if you're writing on something like the Sherman, you're very quickly uh, looking at, if you really want to write something interesting or new, you would be looking at archive material and there's yeah. tons of it um, that can set it apart. Or you're working on like a, an offshoot variant of the Sherman, for example. So yeah. uh, we recently had a guy that was riding on the um, armed recovery Sherman, the M74, which Brazil yes. actually had two or three of them, depending on sourcing. Um, that is an option you can do instead of writing on the Sherman because writing on the Sherman, yeah, you're just sacrificing your entire life at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's just... Um, but actually, my first article was a Sherman for Tanks Encyclopedia. It was the Argentinian Sherman. The, oh, uh, yeah. The, the who... Hepatin Shadow. Oh, I, if yeah, I don't butcher the Shadow. name, um, yeah. just a warning in advance. I try not to butcher the names. I probably <laughs> will. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the Nahuel article is yours also no no um the nahuel is from a an argentinian friend of mine um oh, yeah. we first yeah. had a, a spaniard right on the nahuel mm -hmm. and i think last year or something we got an Ar argentinian that wanted to write on it. about it yeah it's a shame that none of them survived yeah there, there, there is a a sort of an urban legend that one is still around uh, as a monument or something um if that is actually the truth uh, 
as a monument, urban... but it should it, it should be out there. Nah, should have yeah. photos of it since yeah. it's a monument. I'm guessing yeah. you would say like it's someone, it's a garage somewhere. Yeah, in but the yeah, but let let's be real. Um, we after uh, Angesa went bankrupt, we considered the E18 Sakuri as being just lost, scrapped, or whatever. And then I think four t four years ago, it suddenly pops up at a garage in somebody's storage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, possible, um, possible. But, they were but, like 12, 12 of them are made? Of the Nachwells? I'm not completely sure, but yeah. around that number, yeah. yeah. Um, let me check real quick. Um, now let's th this let's this is why you have things encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you have this. Um, this oh, wait. Do we have it? No, we have it on the World War II part. Um, 12, yeah, exactly. 12, 12, 12 plus, plus a wooden prototype, something like this. Yeah, a mock up. But a mock -up. usually, um, when we have to list how many vehicles were built, um, we usually don't write, the, write down the mock ups. Yes. We, um, if there is a prototype, we may just write down the prototype but usually we just write the actual number produced um otherwise you're literally saying in the title 12 produced plus one mock-up plus this plus this plus that it, it can get out of hand fairly quickly yeah um, <laughs> it was just one number it's easier for everybody um yep. but this this tell me about the initiative of tanks encyclopedia uh, yeah it, who created when it was created What's the purpose of it? Initial yeah, purpose. So it, it's actually fairly interesting. Um, Thanks Encyclopedia was founded in 2011 or 2011 uh, by David Bocquelet. And David Bocquelet is a Frenchman. And he is actually not a tank guy. He is a ship guy. <laughs> uh, he likes boats. <laughs> he likes boats. Um, Uh, one of the reasons, David Bocquelet is a, a professional illustrator. And I think many of you uh, may have actually come across some of his illustrations. They are used in a lot of books and so on. Um, you can find them almost at, anywhere at this point. And he's very good at it. And, but Tanks Encyclopedia basically was founded um, for him to sort of test out how uh, the SEO system works. So search optimization. So yeah. if somebody types something in on Google that your website actually pops up, yeah, um, which he was very good at because eventually we, we rewrote the old articles of his and still his old articles would always pop up the uh, before our, the rewritten ones, <laughs> which was not necessarily what we wanted to happen, but it is a testament that he became very good at it. Um, but the website sort of ended up as him posting his illustrations on the website uh, as a way of marketing as well, because people would end up on the website, see all his amazing illustrations, and he would hopefully uh, get some more uh, customers for his illustrations as well, because it's part of his livelihood. Um, and with that, he sort of seems to have gone down because he wanted to get the search optimization properly to um, get a vehicle. You, uh, you get some information from Wikipedia, get some information from other websites, and then merge that together in a brief article, put the illustrations there, get a couple of pictures in there, and do it in all the illustrations he had, which were many many illustrations and that's how t essentially started off as a sort of illustration marketing thing and a sort of test project of his and you see around the 20 mid 2010s you see more people joining in um he sort of i think stan lucian he's a romanian guy he was the uh, team manager for a very long time i think he was the first uh, person to join And essentially, then you sort of gradually see a shift going. More people start to join in and they start to write some articles as well. And they, at first they are very much what David Bocquelet does, but around 2017, 2018, 
um, they start adding books as sources. And eventually from 2018 on, you really see that standards are being put in place that, uh, that we don't accept Wikipedia as a source anymore or as a main source, that you use it for some obscure historical instance or whatever. That's fine, but it's it shouldn't be your source for the vehicle. Um, and from there, you get the ball rolling. More people start to join in. Uh, more professional articles get written. Um, eventually, you've got people that are actually going to archives to get the sources. Um, and yeah, eventually, we get to the point where we are now, where I think we're in a good place. Um, of course, everything can be better, but for um, for a volunteer website, I think we're putting out pretty good content. Yes, um, and uh, besides the, the website, you have also this magazine. Yeah, right. so the magazine uh, it's a bit more difficult. What we do with the magazine is. Um, we published some articles that we couldn't necessarily publish uh, right away, um, or we have some articles that we want to highlight. Um, and we also publish some articles from our sister website, which is Plain Encyclopedia in there. Um, and it, that's essentially us trying to get some extra funds to keep the website running. Um, and recently, uh, I. Uh, I did a feature on there on my trip to Brazil, yeah, uh, which I uh, was a very good format to uh, to talk about. Um, because I want to write on my findings on, for example, the Osorio, but then I would have to write an Osorio article, and <laughs> an Osorio <laughs> article is a huge undertaking to do. Uh, yeah. There's still some archive stuff I need to find in Bovington. Yeah. For example, before I will even begin with it. Yes. And um, so, it, for that, it's ma mainly to um, give some extras to people. Uh, I think I also published the Tomoyo One article there, and basically we just jammed in all the extra illustrations we had at the time. Um, eventually, it gets published on the website which I think is a little bit of the weakness of the magazine, but we do have exclusives in there. Yeah. That's how the magazine sort of works. Yes. Uh, the magazines work on a subscription basis, right? Uh, or by individual no. issues. Yeah. Ours is by individual issues. We do offer them in packs as well. Yeah. I got so it. That so there's also there's also a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, that uh, that has been a, a journey, <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. Uh, I think th this is also before my time in that sense. I joined uh, in 2019, um, so fairly late uh, in that sense. Um, they first started off with like bi-weekly talks, so they would give like coverage over all the articles released in two weeks, uh, in the past two weeks, and some other news and interesting things uh, going on with the website. With the website, and eventually we decide, like, yeah, but we can also because more people were starting to create content on YouTube on particular vehicles. Yes, and we considered, yeah, we could do that as well because, well, we have a huge uh, collection of articles we could pick from. And people were actually using our articles as sources for their videos, which was a little bit like, yeah, <laughs> maybe we should try our hand at this. And at first, it it was literally just us narrating the entire article from start to finish, including all the technical sections. And you can imagine how that eventually goes. Yeah, uh, You get articles like, I think my T43 article was narrated. It took two parts it was in total like 40 to 50 minutes long people aren't going to listen to a 20 minute long technical description of a vehicle that just doesn't work um and eventually you sort of started to cut down make them more of a story uh we yeah. still haven't nailed it down to a point where you where we actually get a lot of clicks i guess um 
not in comparison with Cone of Arc or the Chieftain or that kind of stuff. Um, but it may also be the vehicles we like to ride on. We have we have an eclectic mix, to put it mildly. Uh, like, I think one of the videos on the website is on the Brazilian T-17 Deerhound. Almost nobody knows what a T-17 Deerhound is, let alone that it went to Brazil to begin with. <laughs> Dude, you, yeah, I don't know, but you may be giving me new information here. T-17 uh, in Brazil. Yeah, you, you, Brazil is actually the only country on the planet that has used them in combat units. And all the four remaining uh, T-17 Deerhounds uh, on the, are in, in the world are all in Brazil. I are all here. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, you I you went this. to Porto Alegre, right? Oh my God! To the tank we, museum there. Yes, I've been there in November 2022, and I cannot remember this. My... Let me show you because th this is why why we have the feature that we can share a picture. Yeah. I think right. Yes, uh, it, I should have the picture somewhere, um, and otherwise it should be. Uh, it's on the web website as well. So, uh, um, all right. I do have to check how you share the screen again. <laughs> I think you should go. You should. Oh, it's here. It's here. Yeah. Sorry, it's here. That's no, not mine. It's yours. So that is the T-17 Deerhound. That's the Deerhound. Yeah. You Man, use I these all the way up to the there. 1970s, which is yeah. insane. Um, I saw this vehicle there, and I could not remember. My God. But you're right. Yeah. T-17 Deerhound. Um, mm. The story how you got these actually is amazing. Um, because supposedly how the story goes you guys bought uh the m8 greyhound in the land lease yeah and then the american shipped M supposedly m8 greyhounds to you guys uh, with all the documentation stating hey these are m8 greyhounds and then i can imagine it it's not how it went i think but how i imagine it you, you you saw you you have like a shipping container uh, or a box like a, a wooden box. You guys open it up and then you're like, "Hey, wait! These are not M8 Greyhounds. These are <laughs> whatever." Uh, th so they were T17 Deerhounds, and the problem with the T17 Deerhound is they are absolute trash. <laughs> um, I wrote an article on the T17 Deerhound from the American point of view, from the development side as well, yeah. and they just break down constantly and constantly it's a i'm honestly amazed you got one of these running until 1970 uh because the americans just flat out refused it the brits refused it um and somehow 54 ended up in brazil 54 yep. so uh, uh well we should we should ask we should ask around for 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 more precise information but aren't weren't those vehicles just like dumped yeah yeah they, they are they were i if mean you're, dumped if you're shipping, because... yeah yeah if you're shipping the vehicles with m8 uh greyhound documentation and you give them honestly trash t17s yeah they, 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 the americans dumped this on you dumped this dumped this year yeah <laughs> I, I think the, i think the documentation uh because this comes from uh a book on the uh from Denison Oliveira, if I remember correctly. Denison, Denison de Oliveira. Uh, uh, he's yeah. a historian from, from Curitiba. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, very yeah. good guy. He, he wrote a book on, I think, the FEB or uh, in that direction. And these came in a yeah. passage. Uh, yeah, yeah. The T-17s came in a passage. And the book's in the right passage... there <laughs> in, my, in my bookshelf here. It's, yeah, I think uh... it, I have it somewhere over there. Oh, yeah, I can see it, actually. Oh my God! I forgot the name. It's like something like the uh, uh, yeah destroy I, destroy the enemy up. destroy the enemy. Second. 
That's the one. Exterminate the enemy. Yes, yes, yes. Exterminate the enemy. Yeah. That's the and... one. I have this also. I haven't read it yet, but I, I have it here in my bookshop. Uh, and somewhere in the back, there's a passage uh, on them, on the Brazilian army getting the T-17, where you have like a guy of the army asking the Americans like, uh, this is not what we ordered. <laughs> <laughs> Explain, please, because this was apparently not the first time. Because you guys also ordered one and five millimeter howitzer pieces and got yeah. seventy six howitzer pieces instead. <laughs> when when was this? Uh, this was around the late nineteen yeah nineteen forty three nineteen forty four more or less. You mean it's Lendley's it's Lendley's stuff. This Lendley. is all Lendley's. Yeah. 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 But, but to be completely honest, I can't blame the Americans completely for doing it. Because if you have to make a decision, are we going to ship 54 M8 Greyhounds to the European theater or yeah. to Brazil? You yeah. should go to the battlefield. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Is it a dick that's, move? That's, yes, it's it, a dick move. When, 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 you say <laughs> this, when you say this, I can relate to it because I understand why many of the war material that was promised for preparing the infantry division here weren't delivered, was never delivered. Yeah. But people don't realize that the first semester of 1944 was like this huge undertaking in mm -hmm. military logistics. They were yep. preparing for D-Day. They were preparing for Mariana's campaign. So, my God. Yeah. Where? How can you just uh, send these big crates of, of, of armament to Brazil when you need them on the front lines? Yeah. Yeah. But even then, Brazil got a um, uh, got a special treatment in a sense because Brazil is the only Latin American country that received Germans in the land lease. Yes, fifty of them. Yeah. Um, no other country got this. Um, yes. There's a and reason for it, of course, but um... one other thing, one other thing. I guess Brazil was the first non-belligerent country to sign land lease. Uh, I don't know if it's the, the only one, I'm but not it's the first. Sure. I because believe you. We but... signed it. We signed it in October 1941. Yeah, alongside the Soviet Union. <laughs> the same month. It's yeah. like. Uh, land lease was created March 1941, I believe. Yeah, for yeah. I do remember you guys bought the M3 Stewart like right before you actually got the land lease, and then like 10 stewards or something, and then you went with the rest with land lease. The last with the rest of land lease, yeah. But it was Britain, and then it was China and France, yeah. warring countries, and then. In October, Soviet Union and Brazil. Yeah. What's Brazil doing there? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's in my opinion very, uh, very simple. Is of course a bit a difficult word to use here. Politics is never simple. Yeah. Um, I think it's mainly because Brazil was promising as a potential ally and yeah. could basically with the right equipment could keep the rest of uh, the South American countries in line. Yeah. Uh, plus it's very favorably uh, situated for supplying uh, South uh, supplying North Africa. Africa, North Africa um, and anti anti shipping and anti submarine operations in yeah. Central Atlantic. Yeah. So plus you have Getulio Vargas very much sort of going to each side sort of trying to prong which side gives yeah, him the most where can i where can i earn more work and yeah. did you know that uh vargas uh could talk straight to roosevelt without oh i didn't oh, without okay. uh, translators because they he didn't speak english roosevelt didn't speak portuguese but they both spoke french ah yeah of course yeah <laughs> so so it was uh like this very singular relationship because uh, otherwise he, Roosevelt couldn't have this kind of conversations with other South American presidents. 
but no, with Vargas, I can imagine yeah. he he could. Yeah, it, it it makes Brazil one of those weird countries where you have like American equipment, uh, American tanks, light tanks, uh, Italian light tanks. Yeah, uh, strange for no FTS, yeah. German flak 88s for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> <laughs> the flak yeah, 88 were were bought uh because because of the Ma ASCII mark you, you know this this ASCII mark system mm, ASKI no. ASKI it's okay. this very 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 uh little explored subject okay. it's Ausland pardon my German Ausland this, Auslander uh, yeah. don't the content für Inland Seilung Okay, so special is... accounts for foreign people to to for businesses in the oh uh, yeah like this. it's the 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 highest minister of uh, economics uh, created this system with uh, this this parallel uh, this parallel mark. It's not the actual highest mark. It's like this parallel currency just okay. for uh, foreign trade with south american southern south america countries and this was operational during the later half of the 1930s and it was so beneficial to brazil that germany became the the most um, the top partner for okay for yeah. for for exchange for commerce yeah. international yeah. commerce and... I remember reading something. I was working on a Turkish vehicle, which is something completely different. But um, there I went through the company records of a German company. Yeah. And in those records, they would say like, yeah, businesses in South America are going well or really well and all that kind of stuff that they had like an office, I think, in I think in Sao Paulo and in Buenos Aires. Yes, which <laughs> the, you read and like, ah, <laughs> I <laughs> that's see. Why. That's why they went there. <laughs> <laughs> we bought like eight hundred flux, and just two hundred were delivered. <laughs> I not be, surprised because of because of the beginning of the war. Yeah, and they were blocked uh, initially because the because the the the, the British. Uh, Capture the ship. They uh, they caught the ship in the middle of the the ocean, and they retained the ship. And then Brazilian government protested and said, "It's not war material for Germany. This is my stuff. I bought this yeah. stuff. I paid for it." So the United States uh, interfered and forced the British to release the ship. So the yeah. ship reached us with the, those guns. So that's that's how they that's how they they got here, but it they were supposed to be eight hundred uh, at that's first. A lot, by the way. <laughs> a lot. That's, that's a, lot. a whole lot. Yeah, <laughs> you can see the, the 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 system was was very very uh, lucrative for 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 Brazil yeah. because didn't have to have high smart dollar gold. No, uh, it's sterling pound. Yeah. Nothing. So no. they could buy straight with national currency, and uh, you know that there's another thing I I recently got uh, I recently got aware of that the Navy Brazilian Navy had this deal with Focavulf. Okay, and they were supposed to to assemble Condor four engine bombers. In, okay. In in Rio, they were supposed <laughs> to assemble. This, the, that's this this uh, facsimile that... of this contract because they they started building the Focke Wulf uh, forty four, yeah, Focke Wulf fifty six, which the only one left in the world. It's in Rio. It's in the the Musal Aerospace Museum, and this contract went forward. Went 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 uh, went forward. To Focke-Wulf 200, the Condors, the, the four-engine, okay. four-engine uh, variant, yeah. uh, four-engine bomber, 
Ferran. And those planes were supposed to be assembled in this factory at the, the airport in Rio de Janeiro. And due to the Which factory, beginning the of way? the war, what with which factory? It's called it's called uh, Galeon assembling assembling plant Galeon assembling plant aeronautical okay. assembling plant. You know, it's the international airport from Rio. Yeah, in Rio. Okay. And yeah, I, I was briefly thinking of F and M, which uh, no F and M is the it's the engine. It's the engine yeah, factory. Yeah, the, that, yeah. That, I think that's national why engine was... factory F and M. Because I think they were did supposed to build aeronautical engines uh... and then turn into a a, a, a truck. Uh, mm. company and they build a tank <laughs> yeah and they build a tank yeah ah, tank. <laughs> it, it's your your perhaps worth perhaps stretching the definition of a tank but <laughs> <laughs> something like it this. has tracks <laughs> yeah since it has tracks people call it a tank yeah uh, let's put that forward as the kuchia yeah this was actually the my very first article on Brazil, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. Uh, oh, so this I, photo is amazing. Yeah, it's I got it colorized by a friend narrow of narrow tracks, which yeah, it, it was basically copied from a French concept. Yeah. Uh, and sort of improved it seems because the French concept used some old yeah some design feature I would consider a little bit older yeah um yeah it's an interesting design it, it's it's just weird and I like that it's weird <laughs> and it, I like that it exists <laughs> yeah. this thing is is not very well explored here also I I read very few articles about this there, there is almost nothing about it to begin with it's uh i think at some point i managed to track down the new snippet uh that talks about the sort of the first uh design mock-up yeah. uh expedito uses it in his books and eventually i managed to track it down as well uh, and yeah. then you see that they also designed like a mechanical mule there which is a mechanical like what a mechanical mule a mule um, oh yeah yeah th yeah it's basically like a sort of platform with wheels under it for towing purposes and that kind of stuff Amazing. i think at some point they also put uh anti-tank missiles on there because you can and require not? rifles because why not yeah <laughs> um so you, yeah, you, it... you put the colors on this photo no a friend of mine um a friend of yours I remember seeing it, but it was black and white. Yeah, so I asked a friend, like, hey, can you colorize this for me? Yeah. Um, I think I've... Um, there, there's another one I asked him to colorize, which is perhaps even more interesting, in my opinion. Um, um, <laughs> which is also uh, Brazil-related. Oh, uh, if I can find him. <laughs> yep. And then I just need to has an image. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Oh, that that one was that one is from the nineteen thirty two revolution. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This, uh, it... No, 1932, 1930. 1930. No, th this one was from the Constitutionalist uh, Revolution Constitution? from uh, Sao Paulo. Yeah. In Sao Paulo? Yeah. Oh, 32. So that's uh, a tractor. Yeah, it's yeah. Dark. So first, uh, th this always fascinated me about Brazil before World War II is you have the public forces or the yeah. special police forces or military police yeah, military in that police, sense. Which is and not military police in the general sense in English. No, it, it is. Just regular sort of, police. Yeah, uh, Calabinieri, uh, Gendarmerie. Yeah, Gendarmerie. Sort of mil state militia, you could even yeah, call it at some point. Exactly that. Um, 
But what I always found interesting is that there were literally no limitations on what they could buy. Yeah, eventually, I think when Vargas got in power, he sort of realized, hey, if we let people, if we let all these guys buy whatever they want, um, this is not going to work. <laughs> but you get like a to to sort of make it a bit of a meme, a glorified police force that somehow needs a flamethrower tank. <laughs> what? This was this was built in 1931. This wasn't even built as a for, response for, to the revolution. Yeah. This was before that. Before that, maybe and they were already Sao planning. Paulo. Sao Paulo but, public force. Yeah. So maybe they were already planning things. Yeah. But still. I, well, you should ask some friends of mine who are specialists in, in this in this uh, revolution in this ah. particular conflict. Uh, but. This is really unusual. I, I I don't think I I have ever seen this photo before. This yeah, thing, a, th th this one I uh, this one I seen, but not yeah, this one. Yeah, this one is from. Uh, this one is uh, normally black and white. I got it colorized as well. Yeah. This one's also black and white. This comes from a book on the Sao Paulo uh, public force. And normally, when you open the book. Uh, you have like a sort of front view of the vehicle, sort of um, if you can follow my mouse, yes, uh, okay. somewhere in front of this. And I got a friend of mine to sort of uh, Photoshop the vehicle in front of it away so you could sort of get this view. So you would, uh, in the original picture, you would see around this part and a little bit of this part and yeah. then a vehicle in front of it. Uh, okay. And we basically photoshopped that vehicle uh, from Ouch. the picture yeah. and sort of put this in between as a sort of uh, filler. So yes, you would, filler. so we turned it into one picture that way. It's not Maybe. completely how it's supposed to be, but this is sort of the best we could do with it. Yeah. It's a good so idea of what the scene might have yeah. actually looked like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because of that, the flamethrower part is maybe not the best uh, but it, it it still looks very interesting so uh, this was this was one of a kind vehicle right that they built one of of them of yeah the, there was a sort of, there was a sort of a family um, but it seems that they only built one flamethrower vehicle um, yeah. you have a few eventually got like a heavier vehicle uh, on it um, but there seems to be just one flamethrower tank. Yes. And supposedly it was used very briefly. And um, I've looked at source uh, material on it. The It could be the case. Um, there is a plausibility to it. Um, full confirmation is difficult to actually obtain. Uh, if it actually is, it would be the very first flamethrower tank in history to have seen combat. Oh, yeah. That's a distinction. <laughs> that's a distinction we never expected to have. No, me neither. <laughs> because <laughs> apparently, you, you would expect during World War One that people were like, "Oh, we have trenches. Let's jam flamethrowers into the into the tanks and such." But yeah, apparently this was never the case. Flamethrower tanks were th there. Is that A seven V that maybe had a flamethrower, but um. One one A seven V had a flamethrower. Never heard maybe, of that. Maybe it's a very sketchy story. It, yeah. it, it's, I think it wasn't even really armed as a main armament. Um, yeah. In contrast to this vehicle, which has it as a, a main armament. Incredible. Um, I mean, uh, maybe the earliest well documented case of flamethrowing tanks in wars are from Abyssinia War, Italians L3, L, oh. L yeah. 1935. Yeah. I, I'm yeah, guessing. And, yeah, and after that, you sort of enter the Pacific uh, conflict. Um, so World War II and then the Pacific campaign where you see more flamethrower tanks. Um, they're always a bit of an odd job. Very little is actually written on flamethrower tanks. Which yes. makes them somewhat interesting, but also difficult to uh, research. Very difficult. They are a niche. They are. Yes, they are. 
well, this thing really surprised me. The, the, you know that the first ones are actually the first thanks, thanks in Brazil, uh, domestic thanks, they can be traced back to World War I. I, I I'm guessing this is also from uh... Sao Paulo. Some people in Sao Paulo put some some armor in one one car it was not it was not a tractor it was not a... no yeah i do remember it fakely i haven't looked too much yet in the very early stuff it was I do the remember first the... armored car yeah i do remember the first sort of armored cars were also from the public forces yes and in they Kampal, indeed too. just sort of started slapping on armor plates of steel or even hay bales i read at some point yeah uh, purely because it would offer some protection against gunfire yeah um and then and then this this uh there were three tanks made in porto alegre yeah for the uh, 1930 revolution yeah you had which the, Vargas Paraíba, in power. the Minas, Paraíba, Gerais, Minas Gerais and another one and i yeah always forget <laughs> that name <laughs> It's three uh, states. It's three Brazilian states. Yeah. Uh, Paraíba, Minas Gerais, probably the Rio Grande do Sul. No, not not Rio yeah, Grande. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because because uh, 1930 revolution was uh, was galvanized around these three states. Yeah. Paraíba, Minas Gerais, which. Uh, aligned itself with Vargas and then yep. and then Rio Grande do Sul which was Vargas yeah. state. Yeah. So so it made sense that it's those three num those three names. Yeah, and those got I think 7 mm uh I think Hotchkiss machine guns or Hotchkiss at least they got, guns, they got machine guns. But they were very slow vehicles. I don't know if they actually got to do something from in memory reading about them they never really got to do stuff. Yeah. It, it was, was more like thing, propaganda though. stuff, propaganda <laughs> yeah. for, for Vargas. Uh, they they were uh, paraded in some places. People got to see them. Oh, this is powerful stuff, but never got to be used in in combat. No. Um, and then we got those those Ansaldo L3. Yeah, uh, yeah. You you had the Renault yeah. FTs before that still. Yes, yes. That, those the, were the, the actual FTs, first. The FTs were in 1920, 1920, yeah. And I, I got this, I got this book from from Marshal, Marshal. Oh, you mean José the... Pessoa, Marshal José Pessoa Cavalcante de Albuquerque? He was the first, the first Brazilian to see tanks in combat in the First World War. Yeah. He was a cavalry officer. He got to to command a cavalry platoon of the French army in 1918. I believe it was Argon, around the Argon offensive, and he saw those tanks, the the, the FTs, yeah, uh, in combat, and he got impressed with that, and he wrote the first book in Portuguese about yeah. tanks. Yeah. I and remember that, that, it, that you guys were sort of lucky as well with him having served in them because when you got supposedly when you guys started to buy the Renault FTs, the yeah. French tried to uh, basically dump the scrap on you. Yeah. Uh, and the the guy, uh, the I think he was still a captain back then. He was. Uh, uh, when he was there at the school and he sort of so as the story goes he looked at the renault fts that they were planning to give you and he was like uh nah -uh. uh, <laughs> you're not giving us this yeah where's the good stuff <laughs> yeah he was probably like the only guy in brazilian army of uh, or a handful of guys in brazilian army yeah. that could actually make that judgment this is, yeah, this is it's... crappy vehicles no no this is our these are good vehicles those are crappy vehicles yeah Tanks were extremely new then, uh, and even after World War One, tanks were still in a very difficult position. Yeah, he was. He was after that. He was the first commander of. Uh, yeah, of one of the uh, tank units there. Tank units in the Brazilian army, yep. and after that, he was the idealizer of the new. 
military academy here. Yeah. This, yeah, this... I think it was you. One of some of the first units were like uh, motor mechanization schools or something. Yeah, uh, but it, it's been a while since I read on that. <laughs> <laughs> he was but yeah. After after Renault, you get the Italian L threes, which are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is this is the guy. This is the guy. This is uh, Marshall, Marshall José Pessoa, uh, the first the first tank commander in in Brazil, yep. and he he was inspired by West Point to 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 build this new academy for the Brazilian army. And oh, I I think I think that we bought those those on Saldo and Saldo this uh, Fiat L three. Um, little tanks, this tank cats. Yeah, because we had we had this military observers. Yeah, Arabic during Kenya. the uh, Ethiopian uh, Ethiopian invasion. Yeah, and we bought them for what? For for wool? We exchanged them for wool or for mm. for any pro for, for for some product. Yeah. I, I think they were not paid in 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 lira in. Italian currency. They were paid yeah. in. It was a, it was a, a an exchange for these raw materials. They delivered the tanks, the the small and saldos, and then we got this twelve, twenty four. I don't know. Up until yeah, the beginning of the World War Two, I think I've listed it somewhere, but. <laughs> it should be somewhere here. Uh, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, twenty three were acquired. Twenty three were acquired in nineteen thirty eight. Nineteen thirty eight. I was, yeah, that, I, was I think that this. is what I got from sourcing at least. Um, yeah, maybe they arrived here in 1938. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. That's uh, arrival and acquisition dates are always a bit like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, sometimes people look like, yeah, we bought them then, and they're like, yeah, it's actually a few a year earlier, but yeah, it's a, it's definitely a, earlier than this, I think it's 38. But uh, after that, there comes the, um, the yeah, American. Then you get the stewards. Uh, and then we got the stewards. Yep. And the first stewards, they, they arrive here um, 1941, right? Yeah, it was like a little, like a few months right before you guys went into lent lease with the Americans and were like 10 stewards or something that you bought yourself. Yeah. Uh, and then you uh, essentially started buying the rest through lent lease, um, and eventually you got M3 Lees uh, and Shermans and Greyhounds and, and yeah. Deerhounds because Deerhounds. Yeah. <laughs> because why not? Uh, yeah. But this the this these vehicles made a huge difference for the balance of it, power. It is South very America. much a modernization uh, of the entire armed forces. It's uh, yeah, it, it, in that sense, it is uh, from a military point of view, joining the Americans uh, was a good move. Yeah. Um, eventually, you sort of ended up with a lot of American equipment after that as well, because eventually went with the Walker Bulldogs and so on. Yeah, and then the Vietnam War happens, and then you actually start to realize, like, yeah, but what if we can't get equipment anymore from the Americans because the South Vietnamese are getting everything? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> let's put in let's put in practice another plan. Let's build our own. Yeah, yeah. Which... But uh, these these Shermans, the Shermans arrived here. In the first beginning of forty-four, uh, yeah, it was early on. Beginning of forty-four, the fifty Shermans arrived. Yeah, I didn't think I have it here. No, 
Um, but yeah, it was around 1944, yeah, that you got the Shermans. Yeah. Yeah. And it amazes me that 50, 50 Shermans got delivered at that time frame. Because it looks to me that it was maybe the worst time for those vehicles to, to be shipped outside the... Yeah, you, you can out, imagine outside you the front can line. imagine a lot of fronts where they would have... Yeah, especially uh, the Pacific, because I think those were M4A1s. Yeah, they were M4A1s, yeah. Uh, so they were not like the latest thing for Europe. I don't think they would work out against the German army. Uh, th they are tanks. They have cannons. <laughs> they are cannons, but yeah, not what uh, the Italian and North African experience uh, showed. Like we need to improve this. So yeah. certainly they should be they should be sent to, 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 to a place where they would assist uh, the main yeah. effort, not like be the main effort, or they were sent to to South America, to Brazil, where they could build yeah. a... It a, wouldn't a... surprise me if there if there was some sort of internal uh, or be between some politics between uh, Brazil and the United States going on, like, okay, we do, we are willing to support you in the war, but we do want uh, Shermans, for example, or yes. we do want yes. more than just stewards. You uh, know that it wouldn't surprise me if that has been some sort of debate. Professor uh, Dennison, he has this book on another book, not that book, another book, but but maybe maybe in this book too, uh, he 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 has this research that revealed that uh, General Dutra, which was. Yep the war minister here he proposed to the to the americans to washington he proposed a brazilian army corps to be sent to europe and yeah three divisions being one of those divisions an armor division but the pentagon dismissed this this uh, this proposal yeah. by saying that these things are very complicated. You don't have people qualified for this. This uh, the yeah. amount of effort put on this is would, would be tremendous. We have everything we need here. Thanks a priority. Uh, uh, you know, you know the talk. Yeah. Uh, so they refused the armored division, but they approved the army corps three divisions in August 1943. And in the end, just one division was sent. Like uh, the other two were being prepared, and by the end of '44, they were canceled. And the tanks arrived in the beginning of '44, which makes me think: weren't those tanks um, a gift? Maybe meant for the uh... yeah, like like. Okay, you didn't got your division, but here here are fifty tanks. Yeah, to to keep you, you happy. <laughs> Just to keep you happy in this in that sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking that because yeah, those A ones were combat tested. They were they performed on the average. The the, the mixed results. The, the, they, they were they were good tanks. It's uh, it's difficult to uh say there were bad things when most of the, the germ when a large part of the german fleet were stuk threes and ah, yes. fours and such Individually. It, 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 like of course a tank weighing 50 tons is going to do better than a medium tank weighing 30 tons really it, it, it's a bit yeah it I find there is a reason why I've sort of stopped going too much into World War II debates and things. Yeah, because it's it's a mess. It's honestly a mess. <laughs> with things people like, get yeah. really emotional with their defenses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but I mean, this second uh, second generation of Shermans, they had improved armor. 
they had improved guns, they had improved systems that over the A1 represented a considerable yeah. amount of, yeah. of uh, increasing capabilities. So that's why that's what I I, I that's what I think. Yeah. The A1s yeah, it, are good it, enough it, to be sent here. Yeah. They're not good enough to be sent to frontline combat duty uh, in Germany, across the channel. Maybe they are very good for the Pacific Islands. Yeah, but I think the Marine Corps was running on their uh, on their own variant in the Pacific. Um, yes, but I mean the uh, army, the army units in the Pacific, uh, they could they could do very well with those with those Sherman yeah. A ones, as they did in those islands like Bougainville, yeah. like um, Tarawa, I the think, Philippines, Belilu, uh, um, Tarawa, for instance. The, although they got Tarawa was a three tank in Tarawa. Best. I, I think Tarawa, if I remember correctly, Tarawa, Tarawa geez, that's a name you don't have to say quickly three <laughs> times or something. Um, Tarawa, Tarawa, Tarawa. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they they did have some struggles with them there, um, mainly because the Japanese did a counterattack um, with tanks, even though they were not really good tanks. I. Th from memory, they, uh, the Sherms were not yet in position when they landed. Uh, Japanese counterattacked, and it sort of got into to a point there where they were like, if they actually had good tanks, we would have had a very big problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the tanks in the Pacific had a very rough start in Guadalcanal. They, 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 had, yeah. they, they landed some stewards and all of the stewards, I think, all of the stewards ended up like stuck yeah. in the mud, stuck in something. Uh, yeah, I think it's one of the main critiques that has been put forward on at least the earlier Shermans is um, that the track width is not the best around. Um, it, it is one of the critiques. Eventually, they fix that, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, but they use this with very considerable success in the Pacific due to the lower quality of the Japanese tanks, the lower caliber of the guns, smaller, Earth thinnest and, armor. Yeah. And um, they yeah, use... You really notice that the, um, that the focus on the Japanese with tanks lay somewhere very different than actual tank on tank combat which you can't really blame them um, as things were going where they were. Uh, there weren't really much tanks around. So yeah. just having a machine gun platform or just a simple artillery piece in a tank gun would work. And uh, those were the, like, they were not the first generation of Japanese tanks, but no. uh, they were so, they, they were so isolated in Asia that for a comparison of tonnage and armor and gun caliber they were yeah, not they... really far from the reality they, they they were good vehicles for that particular theater right uh, um they, they, they were good in china and such but in the pacific yes. if the, the moment the americans bring a sherman uh to, into the field yeah stuff becomes difficult very quickly it's you, you almost get a tiger versus uh sherman situation to put it like that in like on a one-on-one -on -one situation yeah but now the americans can actually outproduce you <laughs> yeah by <laughs> a if... long margin by a really huge margin yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. can imagine them. Uh... It was revolutionary. And the Stuart also, which has no success as a frontline vehicle in Europe, it was like uh, relegated to reconnaissance units and um, yeah, another but it, secondary Yeah, it was project. sort of meant as reconnaissance from the get-go. Um, you, you sort of see them going two ways for reconnaissance. You... Um, you, you had reconnaissance where they um, 
had to be sneaky in that sense uh, and quick, which was uh, to end up with the M8 Greyhound. And you had reconnaissance for uh, when you had to get into difficult terrain and were expected to have to fight for reconnaissance. And that yes. was supposed to be the M3 Steward. Um, so you get sort of two different uh, views of reconnaissance where they end up with. Yes. Um, but in the Pacific, the Steward performed relatively yeah, well yeah, to the end. Uh, well, I remember... I remember reading a book by major major Vimer, major what james Vimer. i don't remember his first name but his last name was Vimers, and he he wrote a book about armor in the jungle okay. you, you know this i'm not familiar with it um, thanks in the jungle thanks in the jungle and he analyzed the the use of the tanks in the pacific and also in vietnam but in, in jungle environment. And he said that the 37 millimeter cannon of the Stuart could fire um, could fire this round that had anti-personal ammunition. Ah, uh, yeah. Canister round. Yeah. Yeah, it could fire a canister round. And this canister round made a terrific impact on Japanese resistance on the last day of battle in Tarawa. He said they stopped a whole Banzai charge with two sh two stewards with okay. this canister round. <laughs> <laughs> so it was um, it was yeah, also because... a weapon that was very feared yeah. by by the Japanese. Yeah, although they they had diff eventually they did have a lot of difficulties with the stewards, uh, especially in landing where they sort of feared like yeah at this point we're better off just starting with Shermans instead than yeah. sending in stewards first. Uh, yeah, but the Brazilian army was was re really heavily based on the steward the M3s and fives. <laughs> For extremely decades, heavily. For decades. Uh, they, they used them at least all the way officially um they used all the them way to the 90s. 1988 and even after it they still had some sort of unofficial use or continued use yeah it, it's amazing how long you last with them and they were as you can prove by this picture heavily modified here uh, yeah, but even then, the, the, those were only 53 of them uh, in total that were modified this way. Um, you still used the original steward uh, up until 1988, which is just yeah. baffling. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 there are some, some sources that claim that Paraguay uses used them until the, the first... Yes, yeah, so supposedly first Paraguay reactivated a bunch of them um how was it yeah the, if, supposedly for training but it, how it tends to be written as well as like yeah but we're actually using them sort of it, it's very sketchy if they actually use them or not yeah i couldn't get really good photos of those armored vehicles in paraguay supposedly they also have shermans in yeah, active they service three. they have three Three Shermans, yeah. yeah. So, but every photo I found, it's just this small thumbnail photo, and no, I don't get much details of it. You probably have much better photos over there, because uh, they they actually use these now, or use that. I think they faced them out in twenty eighteen. Um, mm -hmm. Who? Ah, this one. This is one of them. Uh... Continued service in Paraguay. So, oh my. And it's an A1. Uh, yes, they, they have a mix. Um, they, yeah, as I've written here, two M4A4s and one composite uh, or A1 uh, Sherman. And which gun is this? Uh, this is a 105 millimeter gun, the same one that's used on the Amex 13s with the 105. And how did they make this fit in that turret? 
Um, apparently, um, the breach of these guns is not that much bigger than a Firefly, uh, than a 17-pounder, because these are low-pressure guns or yeah. uh, low-velocity guns. Low so velocity. there should be a picture somewhere. Oh, oh yeah, this is uh, the interior. Um, well, it's really small. Yeah, it, it is still cramped. Um, but essentially, um, one of the differences is with the uh, 17 pounder, you uh, want kinetic energy uh, to be at a maximum to get the penetration power. Um, but with this 105, it doesn't shoot an AP round or an APDS or APFSDS round. This is focused on heat rounds. Yeah. Uh, so you get a lot of penetration from the energy inside your shell. Uh, so th you don't need the speed or kinetic energy. So you have less of a recoil. You need a little bit less larger breach and such, which is what made these vehicles viable. It's also um, what made the uh, stewards viable with the 90 millimeters. Yeah. And the cash well, for that uh, for that matter. That's amazing. That's amazing. And one uh, more thing, uh, since we're talking about Paraguay, one thing came to my mind here. Uh, Uruguay. Ah, uh, yeah. Uruguay is amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Uruguay used M48s. No. No? Um, M47? No. Some, something like this? No. One of the patents. One of the early patents. None of the patents. None um, of the patents? No patent has ever wow. been sent. Yeah, you have the M60s, which are technically not patents, but they, uh, Uruguay yeah, doesn't have M60s. Cool. No, no, M60s, I think only Brazil has. Yeah, uh, Argentina has one because mm -hmm. they. One. Yeah, apparently they bought one or leased one for testing if they wanted one, mm -hmm. and yeah. they didn't, and it's mm -hmm. somehow. A, stayed in argentina they didn't it's return weird. It. yeah but my god i think i read somewhere that uruguay had this those early, mm, they, early... Do, they did have walker bulldogs uh do have yeah. walker, Bull, walker bulldogs and they used m3 stewards uh chaffees um yeah. and tyrans these days uh but I can't remember them ever having a patent. I can't remember any uh, South American country getting a patent, uh, discounting the M60, which again is technically a patent. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know where I did got this idea from, but it was it was here in my head, and I thought it was true, but it's not. Okay, uh, they, they do have a very interesting fleet, nevertheless. <laughs> they have, they have. Uruguay is like this, both Uruguay and Paraguay, they have this uh, loose policy on taxation. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 when I was in Brazil, people have told me stories on going to Paraguay to, yeah, uh, what Paraguay is like. <laughs> It's like they don't have any importation taxes, so they yeah. have everything arriving there, everything, like literally. So, and they have this bridge mm -hmm. that connects with Brazil, yep. and everything goes over there. Like, yeah, uh, because in Brazil, I've heard that the importation taxes are insane, really it's, high, it's really high. So, it's like this unspoken deal with the government and the people because they know that if those importations from Paraguay cease, there will be shortages. Yeah. Uh, there will be severe shortages and people will get angry. <laughs> so uh, Brazilian people get very cheap stuff, electronic stuff, all from Paraguay. And Paraguay survives because of this, because it's like yeah. this small nation. So uh, everybody wins. But this is... This is no, this is Argentinian. Yeah, this is Argentinian. Yeah. It's an Argentinian. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, 
the 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 other the the vehicle the other vehicle that was really important for Brazilian army in World War II that came in land lease was the Greyhound. Yeah, it, the, it is by far the vehicle with the biggest legacy of them all. It's yeah. Uh, the Guaranis, even now, the uh, the Guaranis are basically a result uh, of the Greyhounds. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. sort of a, a grandson of the Greyhound. You see, it was the only vehicle that we, not the only, because there were some half tracks and Mm. You know what I mean, but uh, the T seventeens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, but, those were actually the first six by six vehicles you guys had in service. Uh, here, before here, the Greyhounds. Yeah, bef before the Greyhounds. Yep. Yeah, but not in Italy. Not in Italy. No, no. Uh, in Italy, it was just the Greyhounds. Just the Greyhounds. Yeah, but uh, the Greyhound went to combat in Italy, and the experience. Uh, that those cavalry soldiers brought back was really impressive. And mm -hmm. the six by six configuration stayed in the mind of the military yeah. planners. So they they tried, you know this very well, but they tried a lot of variants of modernization and nationalization of the components. You see, <laughs> this is amazing. The turret yeah. of the steward uh on a on a greyhound yeah, no this is on an e9 uh even oh no this is this is a cascavel this is one of yeah. the first cascavel yeah um ah uh, this is the the most famous picture i guess yeah <laughs> this is the first first day of combat this is massarossa in italy yeah eventually you see them uh you get like a uh yeah the when brazil sort of starts uh, a program where they are going to uh, are planning to develop their own vehicles they part of it is get experience by modernizing vehicles and as much as brazil sort of at times seems to run on gambiara which it, it, it's apparently that that is an expression that you can used perfectly for this gambia gambia yeah <laughs> gambia, I, said, gambia. I will put your words yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah the that, was is done, uh, way of living. that was actually done properly um in the sense it was done very methodically you began with okay we got a vehicle let's uh see if we can put a diesel engine in there so the first thing with the m8 greyhounds was okay we'll put a diesel engine in there which succeeded it was a mercedes-benz i think an om uh 321 engine Might be, not certain. um it for anyone don't necessarily nail me down on all the specifics i try to remember as best as i can uh check the articles uh if to, to be sure um and you also started to develop uh bulletproof tires um, bulletproof tires. yeah uh run flats essentially um for the vbb1 and they also ended up on the uh okay the vbb1 I was hoping that there was a link to it. Whoops. Um, but essentially, uh, the VB1, that was one of the first projects that you guys did. Um, so this one. Yeah. And the with that, uh, these tires were supposedly bulletproof. Um, essentially, okay. Sorry, were... dude, I didn't understand you say tires i i heard oh. tigers i don't know oh, why no. tires They're tires okay yeah those tires are bulletproof they are they're solid they are they are uh, they're run flat so yes, um yeah. I'll, I'll i'll just get the article uh sometimes stuff is easier to explain with pictures this does make the website very helpful because i yes. can jump around a lot um here 
So you, um, you, some of the principles behind this is usually with a lot of tires, you have like an inner tire, which is a separate sort of tire. Yeah. And here the outer tire, uh, when you pump air into the tire, it pushes out. So the outer tire is also your inner tire in a sense. Uh, apparently it makes it easier to fix the tire uh, mm -hmm. that way in case it does get penetrated. And then you have the uh, separating um, ring rubber, which is like the in the inner rubber ring here, which yeah. will function as a run flat uh, yes. eventually. Um, and these were developed for both the uh, M8, um, which were among the first tests, uh, and for the uh, and for the VB1, and eventually they end up on the Kashkavels as well. Yes. Um, these were uh, among the first time. sort of projects. Oh, you, were you reading it? <laughs> no, it's the name of the company that made them, Nova Trasson. Yeah, the, 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 you can see them all the way through Brazilian tank history. Uh, if you go to, um, if you see one of those X1s, so uh, one of these. Yeah. It is uh, worth the effort to look at the uh, rubber rings, so the uh, basically the rubber tires of the bogies. Yeah, uh, they tend to have Nova Trasau written on them. Oh, I didn't. I never. I never looked at that. Next yeah, it, time, it's, it's one of those funny details where you can see. Oh, the the they did in fact sort of copy these, or at least. They built suspend uh, components for these suspensions. Amazing. Um, yeah. The, the M8 Greyhound was by far one of the most influential vehicles that ever entered service with Brazil. M8 Greyhound. It was indeed. And this is the VBB. This is the VBR2. Yeah. This, this is, is the VBR2. The... The VBR2 is essentially the first mock-up towards the uh, E9 the would be. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is still when the so the E9 was not necessarily didn't start off necessarily as an Ingesa vehicle. Um, yes. It was first very much done by the army, uh, which sort of came up with the concept, and eventually they sort of sold the design to Ingesa or sold. I, they from how it goes, they just literally gave the all the rights away to NGS and uh, they said, like, have fun with it, <laughs> with they, which they did. And they did, and they did pretty much. Uh, I guess the first first big sale, the, the first sale, the first sale of the, the, of the Cascavel was to Libya. Yeah. Um, and so... after that, the Brazilian army bought it. Only after that. It is, it's sort of mixed. Um, you have the Brazilian army uh, sort of ordering a pre-production patch. And from that, that it does seem that they did order vehicles from it. But um, the pre-production batch was, I think, finished in 1975. Yeah. While the Libyan order was done, I think, in 1974, late 1974-ish. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, the Libyans would be earlier in doing the big order. Uh, and fair, fairly soon after, you also have Chile and Bolivia uh, ordering the E9. Yeah. And uh, after that, like some years after that, most South American countries ended up buying these vehicles. And yep. In in the Middle East, Iraq was a big buyer, right? Uh, Iraq was uh, pretty much the first country to buy the M4 version of the E9. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of ways. Um, with let's go to the um, to this one. Let's 
So uh, this article is essentially the article on the 37 millimeter versions, which Brazil initially used. And th this based the entire early development of the Cascavel. Uh -huh. That's called the, 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 the skinny Cascavel, right? The, the, the magro. Yeah. The, uh, it's the, it's uh, the Cascavel uh, um, magro. I've still not found if it was ever officially called that, but uh, popular naming conventions yeah, called it. Yeah, popular naming culture yeah. is this. And this was then the Gordo. Yeah, yeah. but the, 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 this change at first, the suggestion, was made by Portuguese army? Yeah, yeah. So Portugal was still... Um, Portugal was still in their colonial war, their overseas war, or in war Angola. of Ultimar for the uh, Warhammer fans over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they were looking for more vehicles to basically fight their war and um the first crash Cavell or one of the prototypes were trialed there uh, was trialed in portugal and they were enthusiastic but they were looking at the very apparent flaw of it still having a 37 millimeter while basically everyone went drove around with a 90 millimeter gun at that point and they pointed out like if you want this as long as you can put a 90 millimeter gun and turret on it, uh, like the AML 90s. Um, yeah. And so Brazil did. And they went to Portugal. And I think a few months after they arrived, um, the coup happened in Portugal and they had to pack up ship and they went to Libya and managed to sell it there instead. Um, but it was the, the, even before that, they were considering. Uh, the, the the army was debating for a very long time what kind of armament to put on there. Do we want an auto cannon? Do we want a cannon? Um, but it only it seems that it took to, until 1977 for them to actually decide if they wanted a 90 millimeter or not. And at that point, uh, Libya had already 400 vehicles with 90 millimeter guns. <laughs> the Chileans had like 70 vehicles with 90 millimeter guns the bolivians had a whole bunch um i have like a list here even uh bolivia 24 <laughs> so 200. yeah <laughs> a lot so um, since everybody is buying the 90s that we might as well buy it yeah as and well, Iraq know. was the first country to buy the m the so-called m4 version yeah so the M2 and the M3s are very recognizable um, in the sense that, um, let's go a little bit down here. They have like the headlights on top of the plates here. Yes. That is a very easy thing to distinguish an M2 or an M3 with. Um, there are some small details how you can keep M2s and M3 Kashkavels apart from each other. It's difficult. Um, and eventually, you get you go to the M4, and Iraq seems to be the one that actually bought it. Was the first country to buy it. Yes. And the M4 offers a, a huge amount of uh, improvements. You get a better transmission in there that can uh, handle a Detroit engine, which instead of like 170 horsepower, it can handle 212 horsepower. Um, a completely newly re redesigned turret. So now your turret is designed to uh, more properly accommodate a laser range finder, uh, but also to accommodate uh, passive day night sights. So your gunner can actually now see in the dark. Oh. Um, and the commander can get like a small cupo commander's cupola for himself, which can also house a uh, commander's day night sight. Actually, I can just uh, ET90. Let's get the manual. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, um, so here you have like the extra cupola, and uh, you have like a machine gun on there that could be fired from the inside of the cupola. Um, the Iraqis very specifically also got uh, the Capolas. So this Capola has like a 7.62 machine gun. But yeah. the Iraqis 
supposedly were fans of the point fifties. Uh-huh. Um because they were de- in the Arek RM war, they were supposedly having trouble dealing with helicopters. Yes. So they just, as a last sort of resort of defense, they just started mounting .50 uh, machine guns on everything. Yeah. <laughs> to and counter to, the the. Yeah. So apparently, helicopters are doing uh, pop up att- attacks. Uh, that basically means that the helicopter will fly. Iranian very helicopters. Low. Iranian helicopters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and apparently, um, that basically meant that the a pop-up attack is that the helicopter will fly very low uh, over yeah. the ground, and then suddenly, uh, yeah, appear and then attack the convoy. And by doing this way, um, the convoy, in theory, has almost no time to respond to the attack and as one of the solutions to this problem was basically let's just mount heavy machine guns on every vehicle we have in a convoy um, because air defense will take time to set up um, part of this is why the um, let's get this one is why this vehicle was designed, which is the uh, anti-air EE9, which was supposed to deal with this issue. And here you can also see the point fifty. Point fifty assembled there. Yeah. In an auto cannon there. Yeah. Twenty-five millimeter auto cannon. Um, so the M4, and you can easily recognize an M4 um, because, in the sense that they have the headlights. Uh, mount in the front and the most important thing to uh, distinguish an M4 from an uh, from an M5 or an M6 or an M7 is the exhaust over here the um, exhaust in the back yeah so the Detroits see all seem to have the exhaust in the rear uh, the exhaust pipe yeah. and it seems that only the M4s have ever used the Detroit engine um, all the other vehicles use the OM352A engine from Mercedes-Benz, and they all have the exhaust here in the side. Okay. It's a, I, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to figure out how <laughs> we how you could identify the, uh, the cash valve from, one from to the, the other side. It's yeah it's a challenge and you really <laughs> digged in this 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 in vehicles this cascavels and Eurotus thing amazing yeah. amazing work congratulations uh, because to, i to be fair i can't take full credit of this because uh you have another guys people. like expedito that have yeah. has done a tremendous amount of work yeah, professor um, professor Spedito, he is like I've it's had like help from legend. a lot of yeah. I've I had read help from I, a lot of I read his material guys. for like twenty years. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I've been to his place when I went on uh, when I went to Brazil uh, to look at all these vehicles and such, and it's just insane what he has. It's <laughs> I, I, I he he just set me down behind a desk and he sort of put a photo album in front of me and he was like. Go look. Uh, he can't speak English, by the way. So we sort yeah. of talked through a translator, translator, which was an interesting experience for me as well. When you mean uh, translator, you say a device, not a person. So No, uh, basically, you have an app, which is, for example, yeah. Say Hi from Amazon, but you have other no, apps. I mean, and... a translator was not a person. Was... No, no. Yeah, e- eventually, uh, some family came along and they could sort of translate, but yeah, we, we basically talked through each other by speaking in the phone and then it would translate it and then we were like, oh yeah, that that's great. Uh that's great. we yeah. And he he sort of put a book a photo album in front of me and he was like, yeah, go look. And while I was looking, more photo albums were appearing on uh, on like the desk, and eventually there was like a stack like this large My of God. all photo albums and yeah it was really interesting to see oh uh, but also i've got a lot of help from ingesa employees uh from guys in the army um yeah i th- this is i i can't claim credit to this 
have uh, you spoken my work have you spoken with kiyohara edson kiyohara uh yeah i have uh through facebook a couple of times yeah i've also spoken to flavio Bernardini. Ah, Bernardini, see, see. Yeah, so the uh, Flavio was the one of the CEOs of the company. He contacted me uh, through the Tomoyo One article. Yeah. Um, which but have was... you seen? Have you seen uh, Kiyohara's album? Uh, his the uh, the Osorio yeah. uh, trials. The in, Osorio uh, in Abu yeah. Dhabi. Yep, yeah. I've seen those. Oh, yeah, amazing. Th those were really interesting to see those are really interesting photos my god uh he 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 was looking for the photo of the ariete stuck in the the sand and there was yeah. all pulling the ariete from the sand and somebody sent me this photo a little time ago <laughs> uh... he was looking for that <laughs> mm. but but uh professor spedito he said to me i interviewed him yeah i him. remember and uh, he said to me, I, I say to him, uh, people say that the Osorio's blueprints are lost mm. because they were all electronic files. They were all, they're made in mm. computer. And he said, no, they are here with me. Yeah, he has a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they are with you? Okay. <laughs> because not me, but people are saying those blueprints are lost. We cannot yeah. rebuild the, the, the thing. Yeah, but you, you don't want to rebuild the Osorio to begin with. It's <laughs> it, 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 it's outdated. It, it's Yes, it, yes, yes. It's it, an outdated it's, project. Yeah. But uh, from here and there, Brazilian Army uh, has this new uh, Nova Coraça yeah. project. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. The, oh, new, the new armor. <laughs> uh, I, I have tried to be interested in the new Brazilian acquisition projects, uh, I think for a year or two. Yeah. And eventually just drives you insane. Uh, it, it, yeah. That, <laughs> it, <laughs> at times it just doesn't make sense. Can you elaborate on that? Why it doesn't make sense? Um, part of it is just for example with the b2 chantaro deal it makes yeah. the b2 chantaro is an amazing vehicle it, it, it was also the most sensible candidate of them all yeah. uh, that were proposed and from interchangeability to capability and you already had an iveco plant running in brazil so yeah. it makes sense and then you got the political parties sort of trying to block the sale with reasons that were completely contrary to what was actually happening. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> um, but also with the, um, the Leopard one modernization and the, uh, acquisition numbers of the new main battle tank. So yeah. a lot of the projects of acquisition are spread out from now until 2040. And then they get like two or three vehicles a year and like, why <laughs> two or three vehicles a year yeah i i think the numbers from one of the techno defesa um articles on it yes. that the numbers of the new tank uh were currently around 70 or something which Why? just doesn't make sense because the doctrinal people. need is for like 200 to 250 tanks so why 76 why bother and, to buy just 76 yeah and the modernization of the leopard one has been uh yeah it, in my opinion uh and I, I know this is not a necessarily popular uh opinion the leopard one modernization sort of has to be done unless the brazilian army actually comes up with a uh with a sale that they will actually buy 200 to 250 vehicles in a proper timeline not until 2040 that they have 76 tanks by 2040 uh, that just doesn't work um, because the leopard 1a5 fleet is suffering um they i think at some point they published readiness numbers and it was not great my god and 
I think the thing what I was most annoyed about is that they put forward the reasoning that they won't modernize them because of the conflict in Ukraine, that all the spare parts were uh, gone. But this seems weird because from what I know from talking with people on the Leopard 1s in Brazil is that the drivetrains were all fine. The only thing that wasn't fine anymore on the Leopard 1s was the fire control system. But that is exactly the thing they would be replacing with the modernization. Yeah. So it's eventually, plus how long everything takes, it just, yeah. Uh, I'd <laughs> rather than focus on my articles on the Cold War. I can write those. Um, nothing strange happens with those anymore. Yeah, except for the Sakuri. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. But you have the, I, I have the same feeling. I like history back there. It's yeah. It's all on the table, beginning, middle, and end. You can write about it mm. and be certain of the results uh, of the finishing. But with this yeah. current status things, current current uh, politics, it, uh, it, it's it's so tiresome. It's, it, it, I it get goes, tired. Just we're to... doing this, and then we're not doing this, and we may yeah. be doing this, and then we're not. I, I wrote an article on the uh, Guaganis. Yes, what I mean. Yeah, and I still have to update it because that that is one of the issues when you're riding on a modern vehicle. Yeah, um, you you have to update it uh, constantly. Not constantly, but every now and then you have to update it. And I haven't updated it for I think three years now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a lot of a lot has happened. Yes, yes, but uh, you're you're saying uh, you're talking briefly about how the sukuri is still a developing topic and yeah. the sukuri 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 for us uh, is perhaps the most the most awesome vehicle the most yeah, beautiful it is a vehicle, really cool vehicle have ever developed in brazil it's, mm. it's, um, it's a tank killer it's like oh because I do have some. Yeah, th this is like an Injexco file. So uh, basically, Injexco um, was the um, export branch of Injessa. And mm. this was these were files. These come from Bovington. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ed Francis, uh, he has a YouTube channel, Armored Archives. He knows a whole lot on British stuff. It's uh, amazing. Um, but he had he used to work at Bovington, and he still had these in his personal archive. And yeah. um, these are sort of technical brochures yeah. from uh, Injexco. Uh, and this one is on the Sakuri, for example. So you have, uh, let's go here, the whole turret. So you have like the uh, the ET-1053 one of one and five, three man turret with the uh, Automalaga soft recoil gun. So it, it mm -hmm. uses the same gun as the one on the Chentaro. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I managed to get in contact with one of the guys from Automalaga who worked on the project with uh, Enchessa. For yes. the Sakuri. And it seems that um, so basically Otomalaga was only supposed to supply the gun. Um, but in sort of being there in the talks, they apparently gave some more, uh, they gave a little bit more information than they were supposed to. Uh, yeah. So it's one of the most noticeable details for the E18 Sakuri is the gun shield. The gun shield is exactly the same or almost exactly the same as the one on the Chantaro. And it turns yeah, out, it? yeah. Wow. And as it turns out, um, according to the Italians uh, or the guy from Otomalaga, um, they did some design, they, they sort of interchanged some design uh, features or talked about what works and what didn't work from the Chantaro uh, program. They weren't supposed to, but apparently it happened. So there yeah. is a, there is a, in a way, a uh, Italian link to the Sakuri program. 
Besides just them supplying the gun. My. And this gun was returned to Automelara once yeah. the, the yeah. company so went bankrupt. According to my to an Italian friend of mine, it is actually in the yeah, there is sort of a museum from Automelara or Leonardo as it's called now. And supposedly the gun that was used on the Sakuri is now presented there. Um, oh, it's presented at the museum. Yeah, uh, but it's wow. not an open museum, of course. Wow. You have to get access through Otomalaga to get in the museum. So it's a supposedly, um, maybe. And that's why we never had a, a photo of it. Yep. The fire control system has been... Yeah, so it doesn't give the information here, but it uses a uh, fire control system from Belgium, uh, an OIP LRS-5. It's the same fire control system used on the P1 Osorio. On the first Osorio, the Osorio yeah. 105. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. And this this vehicle, particularly the 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 the, the 18, not the 17, but the 18. Yeah. It looked, it looked really, it looked really capable. It looked really modern. It looked. Yeah. Although it, yeah. So the, it's a bit of shame how they. How this is printed, but it's also it also looks weird. <laughs> Why it, it, the, the proportions look weird of the Sakuri? It's in, in the sense um, when you think of a six by six vehicle with a one hundred five, you think so, you, one of the vehicles you can think of is the AMX ten. Yes, and that one has like a very flat turret and in centered in the middle, and then you have the Sakuri, and it's like a very a pretty big turret in the rear and in the rear it makes it sort of look weird uh it look weird or from an engineering standpoint it's like weird for for an engineer or, or just for, to look i mean no, just to look it's just to look the gravity yeah. center like uh center of gravity i mean uh it's it's not it's not positioned in the way that would compromise though the work the, the, the. no it, it is on a reasonable place with the uh, suspension uh essentially for um taking on the shock the recoil yes In that sense okay. it, the design makes sense on why they did the things they did uh Understand. it just looks interesting <laughs> <laughs> yes it is yes it does and this vehicle um uh, was dismounted uh, yeah yeah have, they... you talked to, have you talked to to furla Hikaru no furla? i've i've never got in contact with furlan or furlan furlan's uh, a great friend of mine he's a very good friend of mine yeah he's i the... never managed to get in contact with him yeah um because he, doesn't he speak used English, to be but... one of the guys that uh that operated the Osorio I think during yes. the Saudi trials actually his he he was in uh with Engeza since mm -hmm. the beginning since like uh the first yeah, the Cascabel sixth. order he told yeah. me he was in Libya with Gaddafi when they when they they settled the first sale yeah yeah he did a few interviews I do remember some information from them yeah here. And he knows a real big, huge deal about these vehicles. Yeah. Everything. He told me everything in the Sukur, Sukuri, Sukuri is is um, from the shelf. It's off the shelf. It's off yeah. the shelf. I mean, the Osorio for a large part was off the shelf as well. Yeah. And in my opinion, in opinion it is one of the weaknesses uh, of the Brazilian defense industry. At the yeah. time, um, because uh, you, you were with the Osorio, in a sense, you were lucky that Vickers was willing to sell the components they were willing to sell. Yeah, because Vickers was not doing well at the time either uh, mm. financially. But any company could uh, could have essentially be like. This is what we're willing to sell you or any country. And uh, but 
if we sell you our top of the line stuff, you will compete with us. So you won't sell. Uh, it, it it puts the Brazilian defense industry in a very risky situation. Um, you are always dependent on what another company is willing to sell you. Yeah. Uh, instead of having it yourselves, and it is understandable why um, Brazilian components weren't available because it's very difficult to actually design a top of the line fire control system. So I can't blame them, but it did put them at a risk. Yes. Um, the 120 millimeter on the Osorio is an example of that, um, because it's definitely, apparently the 120 millimeter on the Osorio, which is the 120 millimeter G1 from the French. Um, one of the issues with the G1 is that the uh, gun pressures were uh, much less than other 120 millimeters. Yes. So it would never be, uh, it could never be as powerful as a 120 millimeter L44, which is problematic. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to sell it at some An point. MBT. Yeah. Sure. For the Saudis, it wasn't necessarily bad because they, their baseline threat was what Iraq had. And then I think the 120 millimeter G1 would have done its job. Um, but if you're starting to deal with an Abrams or a Leopard 1, uh, Leopard 2, sorry, um, that gun will become problematic. Um, but yeah, it was partly also Germans just not willing to sell you a gun. So. <laughs> but yeah. You're right about that. This this whole defense industry thing grew up really fast. Yeah, like, yeah, it's insanely and, quick. Uh, it it was insanely fast, and the problems with this growth uh, they all mounted really quickly over the projects of Angesa. Yeah, which and look look beautiful. They look powerful but uh yeah for the, many reasons the practicability of buying and selling them for, for yeah are... um the, the 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 issue is um eventually and comes up with a lot of designs or interesting concepts like the ugum the shagaka yeah. uh, the scurry the osorio yeah and they all never really sold that well so you gotta the Jagaka sold, so let's get, uh, keep that one out of the picture. But you have a lot of these development costs that just end up in nothing yes. in the end. Um, and this is not necessarily completely to blame to Angesa. It's a very difficult world to get into. Yeah. Um, the Sukuri was a fairly revolutionary uh, vehicle to begin with. Uh, because at the time you only had the French really doing it, and then later on the Italians. So in that sense, that is uh, revolutionary. It is a gamble. Not very many, even now, not that many countries are operating such vehicles. Yes. Uh, the Ogum was again a gamble. Um, it's a very specific vehicle for uh, catering to a very niche uh, purpose. Uh, and yeah, the Osorio, it's difficult for, besides, um, people tend to really point towards American pressure for being the factor of the Osorio not winning those trials, or they, they did win the trials and they lost the contract. Bit. Yeah. But besides, let, let's put aside the American, um, politics behind the deal, um, they they were probably there it wouldn't make sense if they weren't there um but let, let's not look at it you're basically dealing with a company that is supposed to build about 300 tanks for you for a 3 billion us dollar tank sale on a pretty tight schedule which has never built a tank before in its existence it never mass produced a tank before in its uh, existence has components from all over the globe, which are all very, which basically the French could just say, uh, we're not willing to sell you the gun anymore. They, they wouldn't be able to supply anymore. It's very simple. 
Yeah. Um, the Germans could push through and say, uh, we're not selling you the MWM engine anymore. You will be done. Um, so you got all these components that are, uh, are from other countries. You, you would eventually get licenses for it, but um, you still have to arrange those. And in Jessa, at the time, there were already news articles appearing that they were financially not doing all that well. Are you, as a country, willing to gamble on a on such a company to give to give it a three billion US dollar contract? Yeah, I doubt it. To be honest, yeah. Um, sure, American pressure was there, but if you actually look at sort of the financials behind it and just the experience and for such a project, it's a massive risk for a country to spend so much money on a tank from a company that never built a tank. It's difficult. Yeah. Um, let alone the gun technically underperforming compared to an L44. Uh, yeah. And the, yeah, yeah, the reasons are much more complex than uh, popular. It, yeah, it, it is too easy to blame the Americans for it. Yes, that's that's the it, deal. It, it, yeah. you are ignoring a lot, a whole lot of other factors that you can take into account why it was very difficult for the for Ingesa to sell the Osorio. The other flaw, in my opinion, is that. Uh, th this is, for example, to compare to the Turkish defense industry right now. It's a very interesting example to compare the Brazilian defense industry with the Turkish one. Um, the Turkish defense industry is right now seems to be doing quite well. It's rising. It's getting quite a lot of sales. The fundamental difference here is that where the Brazilian defense industry was completely reliant on export, the Turkish defense industry has guarantees from the government that they're actually going to buy the equipment they are developing. So where the Br Brazil was not really able to buy Osorios because you are dealing with the uh, crisis of the 1980s uh, and all the way up to the 1995, um, the Turks, the Turkish government is at least promising that they are willing to buy uh, the Altai tanks. It has been a mess, the program, <laughs> that aside, but yeah. the guarantee is there. And that was never there for the Brazilian defense industry, which is why it was forced to go the export route uh, from the get-go. Yeah. Although not Bernagini. Bernagini is an, ex an exception to that rule. Yeah. Um, well, let's just say it's not an exclusive exclusive matter of the army and its uh, tank selection process. Uh, there's other other examples that can be seen uh, yeah. throughout Brazilian uh, recent military history oh. that that uh, purchases off the shelf from foreign uh, foreign suppliers are preferred than buy from experimental uh, growing yeah. national companies. That, that's several. Yeah. And uh, I would like to for you to talk about so your favorite vehicle. Yeah, that, that is easy. That is so easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it is basically the vehicle that I've put in uh, the article as well. Um, yeah, it's the Tomoya Free. It's yeah. a really interesting vehicle. Um, in my opinion, um, the Brazilian army shouldn't have looked at the Azorio. They should have looked at the Tomoya Free. Yeah, well, Many they, people say this they also. did contract the Tomoya One which yeah. honestly it was not a good tank um that, that it be, the tomoya one began as we're going to build a tomoya 3 but then we realized that we actually don't have the money to build a tomoya 3 
so we'll just build a little bit better m41 walker bulldog instead yeah um but yeah for the tamoyo 3 it is a really interesting vehicle um it was meant for export um but what they managed to do with the weight uh and what they managed to put in there component wise is amazing so it had composite armor a uh, 105 millimeter gun it had a decent fcs uh, fire control system of all the components that could have been better the fire control system could have been one of them it wasn't bad it was more or less in line what um uh, what angesa had on the 105 millimeter osorio um the fire control system so the brains of the fire control system the computer was a little bit worse but in principle they were sort of the same yeah um but it only weighed 35 tons um right, a real lightweight it, it's a really light vehicle and one of the things i want to do uh, i posted so i have a sort of i have a youtube channel i don't do much of it but i do post every now and then something yeah uh, and i did a full walk walk around uh of the tomoy 3 and i sort of go past it one of the things i wanted to do with the tomoy 3 was uh, measure its armor so this is the turret cheeks uh so you have like the cannon in the middle and then you have like the two angled cheeks yes. and one of the things we wanted to know like how thick is that exactly and it turns out that the uh you have like two steel plates here so this is uh, a steel plate over here yes and then you have another steel plate over here they welded two plates of 27 millimeter together and then you'll have a cavity and then again two plates of 27 millimeter each um so in total it seems that it's about 160 to 170 uh, millimeter in uh sort of true thickness in that sense and we're still not completely sure i've asked the owner to see if, uh so i've asked carlos if you could hit the cavity here with a hammer to see if we could hear a hollow sound sadly we couldn't yeah. uh, which was a little bit of a shame um but if there was composite there it's a pretty well armored vehicle uh for its weight it seems to have about equivalent armor of a leopard one a little bit better because it has some form of composite in there or should have yeah um which makes it really good and this was part of the reason why i wanted to visit it so this is for example me measuring a plate uh this is an ultrasonic measuring gouge um one of the issues when you're measuring armor or steel uh for a vehicle is you can try to do it with calipers so base or a measuring tape yeah or you uh but the problem with that is the moment somebody has neatly welded stuff together you can't actually measure the plate thickness anymore because the plates are all match up and you just can't measure it um what you can do is get an ultrasonic measuring gouge and essentially what it does you have like the probe uh, which I have in my hand here yeah and you get like a gel sort of the same gel as uh you use for an ultrasonics uh for, thing for, for babies yeah and you put the probe on the steel and it sends out like uh, a sound wave in the steel and then that bounces back and then you get the thickness of the steel yeah and this is how you can measure vehicles without actually uh which you couldn't measure with calipers yeah you can't measure different materials than steel with it um but you can at least get the steel outer casing and if you then measure uh what i did uh here if you then get like a, a rolling ta rolling tape for this you can measure the total uh thickness of it Great. and you can get some ideas of what the actual thickness is of the armor and I also did this for the Osorio and uh, Jaraka and Ogum and the X1. You measured all of them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That, 
I basically sp I basically planned out three weeks to see and measure every vehicle I needed to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, because this was one of the things. This is, in my opinion, one of the bigger additions to the research of Brazilian tanks. Um, armor measurements or technical details are not that well document documented in sourcing uh, in Brazil. Yeah. So I took it upon myself to go to Brazil myself and measure it up and then uh, publish it in articles. Yeah. Which I did. <laughs> <laughs> not something that uh, the regular tourist would come here to do no it it has so that has been sort of complicated to explain yeah it's the same um i think no tourist would ever end up in santa maria in uh, rio grande do sul yeah um unless you are interested in tanks but otherwise nobody would ever go there i think yeah, it's like this. It's a city that has no no important uh, touristic no. features. Nothing. I think it's, I did all it, the it's, all it's, the sites. It's an industrial before. city. It's an industrial city, which with with uh, big uh, universities. Yeah. Uh, I think I did all the touristic things there in like six hours. Six hours. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> And then you got to see the tanks and measure all of them. <clears throat> yeah. So <laughs> among the things, so I went to the uh, the it was pouring rain, right? Yeah. So eventually they got. So eventually they got the Leopard One A Five and they uh, placed the Osorio under the uh, roof here, so I can actually could actually measure without. Uh, being completely poured in the rain it, <laughs> it, it rained really heavily that day um so yeah uh, i had the chance to get a picture like this <laughs> <laughs> i have one such picture with this as audio it, it was still in the colors of brazilian <laughs> army ah uh, yeah um and where is that photo man one of the I, I keep losing that photo one of the fun things with this one is um like with the tomoyo 3 i also wanted to figure out if this osorio had something of composite armor yes uh, so i asked the guys from the army there like could you give me some rubber hammers or rubber hammer so i can basically whack the turret of the osorio and then hear if it sounded hollow or not. And while I was there, so the first hammer appears and a couple of minutes, two more hammers appear. And eventually I had like five rubber hammers sitting in front of me. I was like, <laughs> I just asked for one people, not five. And it was really nice. Um, and then something interesting happened because I then actually started measuring stuff and I started hitting the turret and the turret yeah. sounded hollow. And, and the, the front hill armor sounded hollow. Um, and when I measured up the sort of the outer plates of the turret, so um, let's see if I can get a bit better picture of that. Uh, I'll have to make do of this one. So when I measured like these plates of the yeah. turret and this plate of the hull, yeah. They were only 15 millimeters. 15? Yeah, it was really weird. And the upper front plate was only 30 millimeters. And most of the the hull seems to be seems to have been constructed out of 15 millimeter plate. Um, it, which really surprised me because we were hoping that um, that well. What's the nominal? Been... What's the nominal armor for for this front plate? uh for the, the front plate is difficult for the turret the maximum line of sight was about 700 millimeters yeah um but realistically because you st you have to deal with the wedge here and the uh the interior uh has like a 
bit of a strange design feature. Um, let me see if I can show it. Um, that's the Ogum that is there. Um, Uh, these are the turret drives, interior turrets. Where was it again? Um, it should be the picture where I take... Ah, here, yeah. And normally, so if you would look at the Osorio, this is basically where the... Uh, early the site in front sort of ends and then what we thought is that this plate would go all the way down but there is some block here i haven't been able to figure out exactly what it was but this also seems to scrape some armor out here which means that in total the actual line of sight of the uh thickness of the osario front turret would have been even less wow it's it was really surprising. It almost felt that the Osorio in which I stepped in, considering the armor was more of a technology demonstrator than a full-on prototype. Um, huh. Yeah. I, I <sighs> this yeah, is the, the first the, time I hear about this. Yeah, I, I know. It's difficult. But here, for example, this was the... Uh, hull rear plate for example this is the hull plate on the rear so but this yeah. was 50 millimeters but i also went to the uh turret uh i did some measurements um yeah so this was the uh hull side yeah which again 50 millimeters and here you can sort of see where they double stacked it so this was 30 millimeters this is um at the turret so this is a little bit behind halfway the turret yes so from the front to a little bit further than halfway the turret um is 30 millimeters and then you go to 15. it was yeah i i, I actually because of these measurements um this is for example the uh, turret top plate which is 23 millimeters um i also measured the side uh this was another top plate i think i also m have a picture that i measured the turret side i think yeah that was here uh from the interior part which was again 27 millimeters if I, at some point i was that i was so much doubting the measurements i was getting on the osorio that i went to a cash <laughs> To check if my measurements were actually <laughs> to correct. To check if the, because the, the it, instrument was working okay. Was working yeah, it was properly. actually working. So I'm still so, not sure well, wh why what, it is. What we're type. saying here, nobody, nobody at the time said that this P2 was like a, a technology demonstrator, not a, not a proper prototype no it, it's this seems it indeed seems that the osorio wasn't that we know was not necessarily a full-on production prototype which we sort of knew but not in how far in its extent yeah um i'm going to be honest it's difficult in what to do with the information <laughs> because um this is what i've been able to do with some measuring and with hitting a hammer on the turret yeah. i have the videos of that by the way yeah um but there there are a few things to consider um it still met the requirements uh for to perform in the trials in saudi arabia so the, uh, the saudis were fine with this um if which was one of the other things we were hoping. If there is no composite in there, might there be something like a filler in there, uh, a weight simulator for the armor? It doesn't seem so because we would have expected the uh, the cavities to not sound hollow. 
which is another thing. They sound hollow. If they were totally hollow, it's difficult to prove. Um, if they are actually hollow, it means that the Osorio went to the Saudi trials a couple of tons underweight than it was supposed to be. Just a couple of tons underweight? Uh, About. We're... we're where uh, if we would go from an interview done with uh with Whitaker, the yeah. old CEO from Angesa, uh he made a claim that the composite package weighed roughly up towards the four tons. Um and considering the most of the steel seems to be fifteen to thirty millimeter, not really what I would have expected of a tank with a lot of armor. Maybe another ton in steel that would have been added, but I that that is not something I can give a good uh, estimation on. But still, say the composite armor was gone, and we go off the figure from Whitaker. Instead of having a tank weighing around forty-four tons, what it was estimated it suddenly weighs forty tons, and the Saudi trials were very much focused on mobility, uh, yes. and. The performance on the fire control system it's yeah it, it makes the trials a little bit difficult um but again do not pin everything on what i'm saying here this is what i have been able to measure this is my findings um yeah it I I don't want people to to now just start screaming that the Osorio has no armor. Um, for all we know, this was meant as a prototype. The actual vehicle would have, would have uh, been most different. likely been very different. Just keep that in mind. Uh, the Saudis were fine with this. Okay. Okay. Don't, don't hold it. Get it out of a context. Yeah. No. Will not do that. Well, <laughs> that is people, yeah. people are going to see the, the the video and take their own conclusions but yeah let's just hope that i won't get too much hate from this <laughs> <laughs> i hope not <laughs> from uh from neither the guys uh from like the guys from Angesa and the people uh and the people watching this <laughs> yeah yeah whoa no but yeah we have to clarify the issue with somebody that was uh, more closely related to the yeah. project back then, maybe with Furlan, maybe with yeah. Furlan, I I will ask him about it, and yeah. let's say what he tells us about this. So um, you say that the nominal the nominal armor of the Osorio differs from the armor you actually found on the prototype. But uh, things that the things that you saw in the Tamoyo tree were more likely, right? Were, were more the the thing what makes the Tamoyo tree um, the Tamoyo tree was more surprising. I think that that is something that has to be considered as well. Um, the Azorio is known with a certain reputation for being. Brazil's finest tank ever built, which yeah. it still is. Um, you can, of course, sort of question how much is it Brazilian, but that aside, yeah. Azorio also, the Tomoyo also uses foreign components, so that put aside. The Azorio is the finest tank Brazil ever built. Um, and But that comes with the reputation with it. And the Tomoyo 3, because it's fair, so unknown uh, in comparison, uh, it doesn't have the reputation. So a lot of things you then find that actually are positive, you're like, oh, this makes it actually pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, besides it being actually a pretty decently designed tank, um, it, it just doesn't have to uh, weigh up against its own reputation. So a lot of, in that sense, uh, the I was very nicely surprised by the Tomoyo 3. Yeah. I would not have expected that the armor was that thick for a vehicle with that weight. Um, which is what makes the Tomoyo 3 uh, an interesting vehicle. And you said, as you mentioned before, 
you said that the Tamoyo tree was a good option for it was the a very Army. good it was a very good option um i think um Expedito did put a price list in uh, his book on the Tomoyo, uh, where he sort of lists uh, how much the entire Tomoyo 3 project had cost. And if you sort of uh, remove the development costs from that and would consider that they would enter a mass scale production, the costs would have do seem to be fairly uh, interesting. You we're looking at around 1.5 million a piece to two. Per car or vehicle? Yeah, I think it was like 1.5 or something. Um, which the Osorio is 2 million. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You do get a certain performance boost with the Osorio. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Tomoyo 3 would have been a cheaper option uh, that would still have been fairly capable. And the in in terms of dependency and from foreign foreign suppliers, what's the situation of the Tamoyo? Is the same one as the, the, the Osorio? It's worse. Yes. Yeah, so, so the Tamoyo three is a little bit better. Um, while the Tamoyo three still uses com foreign components, they they had the same plan to eventually license them. Uh, they if the Tamoyo three would have been a thing, they were. Uh, According to Flavio Benagini, they were going to get the license for the one and five millimeter gun, and they were going to produce them in Brazil. Um, Osorio would have done the same, but from a base perspective, um, the suspension was national. Um, it basically runs on an M41 suspension. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and you guys copied that one, but the entire hull was done by uh, by Benagini. But in comparison with the Osorio, where the third was done by Vickers, the third of the Tamoyo was also done by Bernardini, which is, uh, is again, something different. Because from what I remember, some statements from an NGSA employee, I think it was uh, Reginaldo Bacci. Um, he said, like, yeah, we are willing to sell you um, a license to the Vickers turret, um, but you first have to buy a, cer a certain amount of turrets before we actually will give you the full license to it. Um, with the Tomoyo 3, you wouldn't have had that issue. Um, but still, a lot of components do were imported. So the engine is a Detroit engine. The transmission was a CD850 transmission. Um, I think they did already get a license for the CD850 to produce them, or it was for the CD500. They were planning to get a license. The uh, firefighting system is from Gaviner, which is a uh, British company. They also did firefighting system in the Osorio. The fire control system was from a British company named Ferranti. The stabilization came from the Germans, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the sites came from the Americans from the top of my head, uh, was from Cole Morgan. So you're still dealing with a sort of, we're fusing all these components into a single vehicle, just a little bit less. Yes. Only and what, Flavio, what, what Flavio told you about a, uh, where, where would the vehicle, where would the vehicle go if a first batch of production for Brazilian army would be signed. Did he tell you something about uh, making components national, making less, de yeah. less dependent on foreign suppliers? In, yeah. So if if Brazil would have uh, if Brazil would have bought the Tamoyo, and this, as I said, this is the same with the Osorio. If the Saudis had bought the Osorio. Um, they would essentially try to license as many component license produce as many components as they could, uh, from guns to the engine to uh, transmission to anything. Um, but they did have to get the contract first before that it would yeah. go over to that point. Yeah. In the end, it was 
I, in my mind, in the end, it was a big gamble for both companies. Uh, yeah. They were going into a, a market that is very traditional uh, yeah. with expertise and and sales background that go decades. You're, 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 yeah, you're dealing with countries that have been building things for 60 to 70 years now, if yes. not longer. Yes. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, to bridge especially when you're actually using their components <laughs> yes yes <laughs> which yeah and 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 by it at, at a time that those vehicles were going through a major change that it's the elect electronics yeah uh, insertion in basically all the, the systems right it's not just a mechanical analogical no. vehicle anymore it, it relies on computers now sensors yeah which um, brazilian in industry that sense, i do have to say one of the biggest redeeming factors of the osorio is uh this thing uh it's a laser warning system yeah and even these days a lot of things uh in service with western countries but also in uh with eastern nations don't have a laser, laser uh, warning system yeah and you get the osorio which just offers it in the 1980s yeah. and basically would tell you if somebody would laser uh, would use a laser range finder on your tank or uh would lock onto you with an AT, uh, anti-tank guided missile which uses a some of them use a laser um basically the system would warn you that somebody's locking onto you essentially and they can be linked to smoke launchers as well so the moment it locks on um you uh, the system can be armed that it will then pop the smoke launchers on your vehicle yeah i understand uh we have a a, a question here from danilo he wants to know about your general opinion on the on the quality on the performance of the brazilian tanks in relation to what else was being sold in the world by then what yeah did... um there is a thing i want to separate there um you can't expect brazil was very good in making uh in catering to their market so a cash cavell won't uh outperform a vehicle that uh western nations or the soviet union used at the time but it did very much work to the mark they were catering for the middle east for example which were still very much driving around with uh old t-55s or with uh aml 90s and in that sense for example if you look at the e9 cash Cavell, it's an extremely successful vehicle it's pretty much better than most other 6x6 vehicles driving around at that point um it in a way it challenged the french uh, market dominance uh in the region because at first the cashcavel uses the french gun and turret and after angessa starts to sell like 300 e9s with the french gun and turret the french are sort of starting to realize what is going on and they basically figure out hey if we just make make it impossible for them to buy the guns and turrets that we should be able to uh, remove them from the market as a competitor. Now, it turns out that they could go to Belgium instead and get the Cockrell gun, dead apart. Um, but the platform with which the E9 worked is a much more stable platform compared to an AML-90. And it took the French, in that sense, quite long before they actually uh, developed a 6x6 uh, vehicle that could compete with the E9. Uh, themselves that took until 1979 or something at that point uh and Jess already had a contract with iraq um they were already i think five six hundred vehicles deep uh in sales even more yeah um so the e9 was an amazing vehicle and the Urutu only made more sense to uh put it in there on the market because most countries that bought an e9 also bought the e11 um and the E11, yeah, it's an APC. 
Hmm. In my opinion, uh, APCs are there to be cheap, to protect your crew, uh, and they should be sort of functional. I try to sit in an Urutu. Um, note, I am from the Netherlands. I am 185. Uh, I'm not even that tall here. Uh, I'm like the average, I think. Um, but I could not really fit that well in an Urutu. <laughs> Uh, I could fit very well in a Guagani, it's, by the way. It, it's the the ceiling is is very yeah. low. Uh, yeah, I my, I have difficulties also. Uh, the, the, all the times I was inside the vehicle, I had to I had to crouch. Yeah. And if you look, for example, at the modernization programs, uh, the M forty one C modernization. Uh, if you actually go a little bit more to the export modernization programs from Bernagini, uh, so the export modernization offered uh, extra armor, side skirts, a uh, high velocity cannon. Um, those are actually f very good. Um, they were competing with, uh, the, they would have competed with other M41 modernizations on the market at the time. The problem is that most countries that did, that wanted an M41 modernization could do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah. You could um, sell a, a service that everyone knows how to do. Yeah. Yeah. Point in um, case. And... And the, the countries that couldn't do it, for example, Uruguay, they only had 24 vehicles. So that, 22, actually. Th that's not really going to save your, uh, your, your development costs in that sense. Uh, the Tomoya one is not great for its time. Let's be honest, it's not a great tank. It was an interesting project, but it had all the limitations you could expect with it. The Tomoya 3 was excellent. Um, for its weight class, you would compare to a TAM from Argentina. Um, the Azor the Tomoya 3 is a little bit um, heavier, but it offers much more armor uh, in response, which, in my opinion, makes it a lot better vehicle for that reason. Uh, the TAM doesn't have that much armor. <laughs> <laughs> it's very little armor. Um, and the Osorio is... It's you, you can't deny that it was a good vehicle. It just can't compete on the same level, toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with a Leopard 2 or an M1 Abrams. There, there are just certain components that just can't compete from, their, from the basis on which is the gun mainly. But you, you would really want another gun in there. Uh, but it's difficult when you have to get it from the Germans. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's something that I have not really taken into account that the gun and the Osorio for an MBT world class MBT and for all that matters, it was sold as the most modern tank in the world. I mean, uh, back then and even today, you can you can hear testimonies of uh, engineers from Ingeza and in people from that business that the Abrams was adapted to electro electronic warfare and the Osorio was born in electronic warf warfare. Yeah. And this... Yeah, what, what, what makes the Osorio an excellent tank is the fire control system is a very good fire control system. And again, as I uh, showed you, the uh, laser warning system, for example, is something very new. Yes. And Jessa did what they were very good at. They, um, as much as they uh, got all those foreign components, and Jessa was very good at merging them into a single vehicle. Yes. And that is where the Osorio was, I would say, in that sense, it was the peak of their ability to combine foreign components um, for what they had achieved up to then. Um, it, the Azorio ju just, the only downside to the Azorio is not something uh, Angesa could have really done much about. It, it's the 
it's the issue of the concept of what a country is willing to sell you. Um, and the, the, the only real flaw I have with the Osorio is the gun. Um, the gun. Yeah. Up that, until that now, is... up until now, when you discover that the armor. Yeah, is not... then the armor. Oh, but yes, but as I said, with the armor, uh, this was the prototype. It's not a production vehicle. So it's, yeah, you, you <laughs> can't fully pin it that the armor was yeah. going to be bad. Um, it could have been better, but. Again, it weighs 44 tons compared to 60 tons for an Abrams or a Leopard 2. Uh, there's a reason why they are heavy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't cheat yeah. physics in that sense. No, no, you cannot. Uh, so, Darren, man, I wish to to thank you for your for your willing to. To spend a few yeah. hours with us here and no problem. Tell about Thank you very much for letting me. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no. Believe me, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very you much. You have you have this so so uh, interesting passion, and inside that interesting passion, this really singular focus on Brazilian yeah. art. Yeah, it's a really weird focus. Yeah, uh, yeah. Brazilians you, you should be have... proud of their vehicles. Yes, it, it is. Everyone knows about German vehicles. Everyone knows about British vehicles or American vehicles. Uh, and Brazil has a, an amazing history in armored vehicles. It just gets overlooked. And that is something I am trying to change. And I think more people are trying to change these days. Yes. And we're getting there. Yes. And, you know, uh, you cannot go from one to 100 without going from two two three four five six oh no what, what i what i mean is you cannot get a, a really good vehicle without designing bad vehicles uh, yep. every industry was like this american industry was like this german industry was like this so yeah. uh we have to go through medium vehicles to through average vehicles to get to good really really good vehicles so that's my feeling about the about the the brazilian mbt industry yeah because on armored cars on on reconnaissance armored cars we we got really far we got yeah you, you definitely to... knew what you were doing and it yes. was very good um, yes, but <laughs> it is what it is, and I'm yep. sure we have we have dealt with um, a real big chunk of the history of Brazilian military vehicles, not military yep. vehicles, armored vehicles, and I think one more time, Darren, for being here. Thank yep. Encyclopedia thank you very much for, for letting the me. Amazing work they do, and. If you don't know Tank Encyclopedia, please go to their website, uh, see their YouTube channel. They have their magazine and a lot of other stuff that you might be interested in. So, Darren, man, thanks a lot. I know it's a little bit late for you there. Yep. But... Yeah, it's just 10 <laughs> o'clock. It could be. <laughs> could be worse. <laughs> Oh. But we are almost in, in three hours in. Yeah, this, this, it took a little interview. bit longer than I expected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, uh, I would like to, to thank Quintino, which is here yeah. following us, and Danilo, which is here following us also. And once this is subtitled to Portuguese, many other people will see it. Uh, yeah, yeah very again, sorry, I, my Portuguese is not great. No, we we are used to it. Mm. <laughs> almost almost nobody uh, speaks Portuguese outside the, the, the Portuguese-speaking yeah. countries. Let alone Brazilian Portuguese, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, it's the people say people say that it's difficult to understand in comparison to Portu Portuguese Portuguese Portugal Portuguese. For people who are learning the language, I, yeah. I noticed that you speak with a little Portuguese accent. I try. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I just mean, go with the, Portugal the accent. I... Portugal yeah. accent. 
I for just instance, tried to go for instance, with Cascavel, Cascavel, Cash, Cascavel, Cascavel yeah. is is the way Portuguese people would speak the 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 the, the word. Yeah. Uh, or a little bit the the people from Rio de Janeiro, but not actually from the <laughs> other the Carioca. other part of Brazil, <laughs> the Cariocas, the Cariocas. And so so. I, I I understand, but we have finally a uh, solution for these problems with the new yeah, translations translation devices. They, yeah. they they cut they cut the problem in half. So thanks a lot, everybody Thank who listened to well. us, and thanks a lot, Darren. Uh, congratulations for your work, man! It's Thank really you. really amazing. Uh, Actually, there's there's really uh, the, 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 there's really so l much limited material on these vehicles in English that I think yeah there's almost maybe nothing in English. Everybody and the will, information will. that is available is wrong, yeah. <laughs> which makes it worse. <laughs> which makes it very worse. But uh, maybe everybody who looks for information on Brazilian armored vehicles go to your material go to your your yeah, the, yeah there, there are a few youtube videos i've worked with but um th there there is uh i i do my best <laughs> yeah you're doing your best and you're doing very very well very very well congratulations one more time thanks for everybody who followed us until now and have a great time. See you next time.